James, who has got some introductions of his team that he wants to share with us. So, uh, <clears throat> Director Burke here. Director Peterson here. Director Gillies here. Director Mobley here. Director Delacante here. Uh, Director here. Hayes here. Yes. Yep, he's there. All right, Director Ishmael here. And Director Beer here. We're all here. Very good. All right. James, you want to start with the SRA staff? Yeah, um, as you know, what we've been doing the past four or five meetings is introducing the staff that you don't get to see all the time. Um, and today it's the IT department. And Brad is not here. He had a doctor's appointment that was rescheduled, so he's not here. But um, but you know Brad, and we can put him on, bring it back to the next one. This is going to be really short. Yeah, it's going to be short. So, uh, <laughs> so we, have, we have two IT members. We have Jesus and we have Gabe. And I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about themselves and what they do. Let's start with Gabriel, Gabe here in the back. Hi, I'm Gabe Rice, a database administrator, and I've been working here since uh, April of 2021. So this April will be marked my second year. Wow. All right, thank you, yeah. Gabe. You, know, you can tell us some more about what he does. Yeah, yeah. sure. What about databases? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> my first project was to create the incident reporting database for the fleet department. So that's the first thing I tackled, and I sort of modeled it after the database user interface that we currently have, which is, you know, that's what we had. That's what I had to go off of. <laughs> so, um, and um, I learned all about the Linnell gate access system. So transferring data from our active net ID badge, you know, swiping system to, to get it to the actual gates to get, you know, for so people can swipe and gain access. Um, a lot of different things, um, working with community developments, uh, fixing little things here and there for them. Um, currently, I'm creating, between them and natural resources, I'm creating sort of a dashboard system so that they have more uh, usability and accessibility to the database. Um, yeah, and yeah, just lots of ongoing projects. <laughs> Never know. No. no. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Gabe. Yeah, and, uh, and I'm Jesus Mendoza. I was an intern in 2017, and uh, in April 2017, and then in November I was hired on, and then I do a little bit of everything. <laughs> I do the support, I do the phone system, the emails, and I know a little bit, probably like 20% of everyone's work like i can do a little bit of front desk work <laughs> i help them out and all that kind of stuff right but it's just a, a small amount <laughs> all right thank you jesus and, and a key person for the board well and jesus yeah. attends every board meeting and every committee meet i mean he's he he's well qualified to be on the board right? <laughs> like, it's a degree of knowledge of us far away so well, who was the internship through that was well i got it because it I was still getting emails from COCC. Okay. So somehow COCC had it and they sent it to me. And then it was to um, Express Personnel. Right. Thank you, David. Yeah. All right. Uh -huh. I want to do the rest of the staff. Yeah. Well, oh, well, do you want to yeah, we'll go ahead and already? do the rest of the staff, right? Okay. Well, um, we can all introduce ourselves. James Lewis, General Manager. Susan Burke, communication. Joe Healy, controller. Patty Gentilomo, natural resources. And Bennett, recreation. Gabe Rice, database administrator. Kelly Allen, HR. Keith Caceres, assistant general manager. This is Mendoza from IT. All right, thank you. All right, Bill? Yeah, the next um, portion of the agenda is the homeowners forum that we do during both the work sessions on Fridays and on Saturday uh, board meetings. Uh, it's an opportunity for homeowners to share their thoughts uh, with us and for us to listen to those thoughts. It's not uh, a decision-making or resolution um, sort of forum. Uh, there may be questions that are easily answered by staff, or best answered by staff. Uh, it's something that the, uh, uh, the homeowner coming before the board uh, has a question about. We ask it 
to be limited to three minutes and there's a cutoff at five, um, as you can see from our agenda, agendas, if you're familiar with them, they're rather lengthy, so uh, there's a lot of work to be done. We also encourage people to submit in writing, um, and uh, as appropriate, there may be follow-up from board members or staff or individual uh, presenters. We usually divvy up those responsibilities at Saturday meeting. So we have one person who has submitted um, today. Um, part of the process too is if you're hoping to uh, or wishing to speak to the board, there's a form to fill out here that gives your name, your address, contact information. That's helpful for us for recording and getting on the record in our minutes, as well as for us to do follow-up. Uh, and the uh, one person today uh, is Signa Gibson. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you can answer my subject matter question today, then that'll be great. And if not, I'll we'll see where, where we go. Um, Over 50 years ago, when Sun River was developed, it was common practice as it is now for the developers to assign a lot number to the um, residential home sites. And as you know, within Sun River Resort, the lot numbers continue to serve as a local address for the home sites. And Deschutes County also provides a five digit physical address for each site. Recently, with GPS mapping, the lot address or the county address can be used to direct people to each lot or home. I have noticed that real estate sales ads now include both the county and the lot address. The current Sun River Design Manual 29.07 States homes must provide house numbers of contrasting color in view under a light source. There is no mention of which house number, the lot or the county. I've also noticed that SROA has adapted to change in the last 50 years, such as the fiber to home project and facilitating the startup of recycling at the home. Earlier projects that adapted to perceived community needs include the presence of cell phone towers, the owner's boat launch, and shark. Today, I approached the board to request a task force or work group to be created to identify the pros and cons of switching the lot address to the county address within Sun River. And you might say, well, if it's not broken, why fix it? I challenge that response was the following observation. Simplicity number one, if owners receive mail at the post office, we currently have three addresses, the post office box, the county and the lot address. Do the county and the lot address duplicate each other? Number two is clarity with delivery. deliveries. As you know, online purchases and home delivery have dramatically increased, particularly in the past five to 10 years. Currently, packages may be delivered using the county address to the home, but we have discovered that several carriers, such as FedEx, drop the package at the local Sun River Post Office branch. Without a post office box number on the package, or if one didn't have a post office box on the address label, the Sun River branch uh, for us has returned several orders to the seller. We have tried to place orders with the post office box number and the physical address, but the forms online often object to that and don't allow purchase, or it needs to be sent to another address. Until recently, the Sun River Branch Post Office told us that packages dropped off at the post office by other carriers would be held for three days once a note went into our PO box. With this news, despite Sun River being our permanent residence now, we changed our prescription delivery address to a condo in Portland 
because we could not risk having our prescriptions returned if they weren't picked up within three days from the notice in the PO box. In confirming the three-day post office hold yesterday, we were told by uh, Stephanie that now they will hold packages for 15 days, but it's not a written policy. And again, that's 15 days after a notice goes into your PO box. So you need to sort of be on top of picking up the mail. The third point I'd like to bring up is potential home mail delivery. When inquiring about this 25 to 30 years ago, see our mm -hmm. first lot was purchased in 1980. So we've seen the transitions with the, uh, the PO boxes from the mall to where they're currently located. But we were told at that time that the Bend Postmaster denied home delivery within Sun River due to density. But now the population within Sun River Resort and the surrounding Sun River area, which is all included in the zip code 97707, uh, the density may now meet the USPS guidelines for rural delivery or delivery as a cluster within this area. Superficial, superficially, I have looked at the census within our zip code, and we also now have a delivery point code assigned by the Postal Service, which is 2579. If cluster boxes are eventually permitted by the Postal Postal Service, and then some conversations here within SROA, the boxes don't have to be gray and metal like you see in a lot of neighborhoods in Bend. For example, in Broken Top, where we were last week, that community has some small cluster mail boxes that are designed to blend into the landscape. The fourth point I'd like to uh, bring up is potential hardship home mail delivery within Sun River. This service is offered by the Postal Service by physician order for disabled persons to receive daily mail service to the home. With designated mail delivery within Sun River, this option would be more likely to be available to owners with medical issues that impair picking up mail at the post office, which for us is a drive. Near the conclusion of the fiber to home presentation on Tuesday, it was mentioned that fiber is a selling feature to buyers. I suggest that home mail delivery is also a selling feature over the requirement to have a PO box. So I have two issues to explore by work group or task force. The address, which is at Lot or County, and will it continue to be both? And home postal delivery, exploring that option now given what's going on with the density and with the um, frequency of online purchasing. Before you say no to my proposal, if you have additional information for me to consider, I, I welcome that. And before you say no to looking into home mail delivery, please consider all the owners who might be frustrated with having three addresses for their property. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think you speak for almost all residents. Thank you. Frustration. Well, there we go. Yeah. On the frustration. On the frustration. Oh, Not okay. necessarily whether you should have a mailbox. No. Signal, would you like to submit that written <clears throat> information? Sure. Okay. And I'd like to serve on the task force <clears throat> for the um, project work. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Yep. Um, yeah, if you can just pass it to James and yeah, I'd like to. I can see. Oh, no, I would have thought that better. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So that's hey, the James, only. Um, James, I'm just curious. This is Juliana. Um, what is the history <clears throat> of the dual address system, if you know it? Yeah, the history, it goes way back to. Um, when the lots were originally being platted in Sun River, the lot number that you have is actually the lot number that is a, that um, is designated on the official recorded plat with the county clerk. So when a when a plat is recorded, it's the surveyed um, essentially drawing showing all of the lot layout, um, and there's a number assigned to each to each lot. So the lot number 
on your home is uh, matches the lot on the plat, the recorded plat. A single digit, yeah. double digit? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the one through 24 or something like that. Yeah. Um, the county, though, Deschutes County has a property address. I, I talked to the county and the post office on this issue, so I can give you a quick, quick update on this. Um, Deschutes County has a property address coordinator, and they assign the five-digit number. Um, they don't recognize the lot number. Um, essentially, any any plat recorded anywhere has a lot number on it. But, you know, in my neighborhood, I have a lot number, but I don't use a, a one or two digit number. I use the number that's assigned by the county. The county does that for purposes of, uh, say, emergency services notification, you know, so fire or police. Um, and, and again, I don't know internal here, but like elsewhere in the county, they that's the official lot number that gets plugged in and emergency services knows how to to get to that property. That's that's why the county assigns their own address and their their unique addresses. Um, but historically, you know, Sun River has used uh, the two digit number, uh, the one or two digit number for internal identification. The five digit number we've never used. It's used mostly by the post office. Um, and then also speaking to local post office, um, they it. it it's, uh, we can't tell them what to do. And in, in short, um, we can lobby them, but they don't have a lot of incentive to 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 change the way they do things today. I'm trying to be tactful and <laughs> how I say this. Um, but again, I mean, we could lobby them. We could um, come up with a full report that says, okay, here's here's the reasons why, and we could submit it to them. Um, and internal, you know, we could require we could change, SROA could change, uh, and and essentially, rather than just the addresses, the two digit, one or two digit um, lot number address on the house, I mean, we could also, I, there's no reason why we could not allow the five digit address to be on there too. But then it's gonna be up to the post office and it's gonna be up to UPS, FedEx, how they wanna deliver. And we just, we, we can lobby, but we don't have any control over their decision. Mm -hmm. So there's Scott, I see you're raising your hand. If you oh, I have one, 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 one wait a second, if you want exactly. to uh, speak it's during the owner's form, 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 please come forward and I did fill up a little card. Oh, okay. Yeah, we don't have it at the beginning of the day. Though, okay. I'm in doing this. Down to Gerhard. Scott. Go ahead, Scott. Oh. Hello, Scott Hartung, number one Lost Lane. Uh, I wanted to just make a comment about vacation rental. I know some time back, the board and a task force put a lot of good work into addressing this issue. And one little thing I've noticed is that in that process, there is a system in place whereby the police who respond to rental issues, noise issues, make a record of that and it's given, I believe, to SROA. And then after a certain number of complaints <clears throat> in a certain period of time, then a fine's imposed on the property. And in some interaction, I've noticed that the Police give the information to SROA, but property management and property owners are not notified. So the first time any management or owner would know is when they get the fine. And maybe we could look at tweaking that up so that owners and or managers could take some action before the fine happens. When we, um, going back, just addressing this real quick, um, a year and a half ago, two years ago, when we did our um, uh, owner, our education and uh, awareness project, we created the nuisance <clears throat> property rule that's now part of our rules. And Gabe, who does our database, as part of setting that up, what he was referring to with the police, um, is you're correct after a certain number of, of um, report citations, for example, or violations of a property, um, 
the the owner of the property rather than the renters or whoever the visitors are can be given a citation. However, when we set up the database for all the properties that we know that are rentals, and we don't have all of them, but we have a large number of them, when a, uh, a, a violation or notes are put into that database, the property manager or the and or the owner get an email, they get a direct email. So they are notified. And we do that for the purpose of exactly what you're saying, so that um, you know that something's going on on your property before you get the citation, so you have an opportunity to correct it. And since we've put that in place for two years now, we haven't had one single property that has gone into that nuisance property category. So we did that specifically out of out of fairness to the owner, so that they don't right, end up yeah. in this situation like you're talking so, about. And ultimately, what it does too is by notifying the property manager, <clears throat> they have an opportunity. If I was an owner and the property and and there were things happening on my property and I had a property manager that was supposed to be taking care of the property, right? Um, and all these things were happening. Um, so the property managers have been pretty diligent <laughs> about taking care of these issues too. They want to retain the business. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. The, so. the exception is the owners that do not provide us their email and their property manager. Correct. We we do not, if we do not have that, then we can't notify them. So that's part of when we have been doing our request for information. Um, you know, this is part of part of the message that we've told them for this reason, for other safety reasons you left a door open in your house we can contact you totally unrelated to violations so yeah okay all right Thanks. thank you scott thank you oh yeah and about the the mail issue if you look of course like everything else in sun river it's come up many times in the past yeah, sure, yeah. and there was twice that recently that that was looked at pretty closely and <clears throat> One was when they took the post office out of the out of the village over the business park, and then at nine when nine eleven after nine eleven, the county and SOA came up with a policy about the lot number versus the five digit number because the county at that time required everybody to have the five digit, but they made an exception for Sun River at that time. So, like I said, most issues are not brand new. So, yeah, <laughs> you right. know, a lot of that homework's already been done. Thanks, guys. All right, thank thank you. You. If you look at the tax plats for the county, it has all of our lot numbers on that. Yeah, but I think, you know, I don't want to get too much into the weeds here, but the big problem is, is that the database that online services use that comes from the post office does not include either of those addresses. It doesn't include the, the Sun River plot, plot number and it doesn't include the five digit number. The yeah. online data that we use? No, the, the service provider. Oh, oh, gotcha. The yeah. EDS and FedEx. And yeah. So, yeah. So when you try to <clears throat> you type in your 10 East Park Lane, as an example, does not recognize the address. You type in the 56963 East Park Lane, doesn't recognize that ad. Well, that's a problem. I don't think Google doesn't even recognize that might have been exists. It calls it uh, something other than a lane, and it, it, it's just a road that doesn't yeah. exist. All right. Jim, I think. Uh, Jim? <laughs> James. James. <laughs> introduce Jim? James. James, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. So, go ahead. Yeah, Jim Anderson is here from Mid-State Electric. Um, as you know, we've over the past few meetings, we've had folks from various entities that we do business with, that we are partners with, um, coming and explaining to you what they do and what their organization um, has plans for in Sun River in the future. So we've asked Jim, and he's agreed to show up today. So thank you. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me out here. It's always good to talk about Mid-State. Coming up on almost two years at Mid-State, so a lot going on. Mid-State is, is growing like crazy. Um, you guys are probably seen the building going around here. Uh, we're averaging about 5% low growth across the co-op. Uh, currently, we're at 21,647 meters. So since I came on board, that's about 1,200 meters that we've increased at the co-op. Um, our plant value, we've invested about 20 million in plant in the last two years. So we're looking at the infrastructure and how to actually make us more reliable. 
and make us a little bit uh, less dependent on a one source uh, feed for all of the membership. And currently, we have one source of feed with Bonneville Power, and that is on Philly Mute Road, which is just down from the state headquarters. Um, our board, uh, being very proactive, has decided to go ahead and do or permit us to uh, pursue another tie line at the Diamond Lake 138 uh, 97 junction. So we're going to have a second point of contact with the Bonneville Power. Um, that's going to be a five year project uh, that we're going to be doing. That'll allow us to flip between Finley Butte and Diamond Lake. So we should never really see an extended power outage uh, on the BPA side. Plus, it'll help us with the PSPS uh, public safety power shutoffs. Um, we've been on the edge of them a couple times here. Uh, so we're just trying to try to make sure our system is very redundant and very, very good. Um, with that, we're going to rebuild 35 miles of transmission line. We've already started on that project. Five new substation re, uh, rebuilds uh, in that process. So there's a lot of work going on there to try to make us more reliable and a little bit, you know, you're not going to notice this uh, is the goal. So if we're working on something, we don't want you to know we're working on it. So power stays in basically uninterrupted. Um, Mid state is going to get 70 employees this year. Currently, we're at 64, which is the highest uh, amount of employees the state's ever had. Um, but with our growth rate, uh, we're finding out we need the employees. Um, very fortunate, Mid state is developed quite a reputation here in the last year or so where we're the place to go to actually go to work. Um, so we have not experienced the shortage of employee recruitment that uh, most businesses have. So we're kind of proud of that one right now as, as things go on. We've rolled out some new programs. Uh, some of the programs we're rolling out is going to be EV charging. And MidState is going to be providing an EV charger to everyone that purchases an EV in the MidState system. That'll be free of charge. Um, that's that's big for us. Uh, so that'll be kicking off here pretty quick. We've had to wait on supply chain to get those chargers in, but they'll be here soon. Uh, we're also working with Sun River and Joe Hall, my department, one of my managers, doing a lot of work and getting out in front of some people and finding out if we can put those at the village or put at the mall, wherever we may be able to put those in the cluster charger. Um, we're also looking at some DC fast chargers coming. We'll be placing three this year. Um, we, we would like to locate one here in Sun River. Um, the village would be a great spot for us to locate uh, a DC fast charger. Um, we're also looking at locating them on uh, Highway 58 and actually over in the Christmas Valley area. So we're going to try to get out there. We're being very proactive. We're, I believe we're kind of taking the lead in the state as far as co-ops go, trying to get those charters in front of our, of our members, which are you guys. So that one's going on and, and it's, it's really going well for us. And I guess what's more concerning for you guys is Sun River. So what's happening in Sun River this year? So, you know, we've had some areas uh, that are faulting out. So basically the cable's got mold, we've had some issues. So we have three areas this year that we're going to be working at. Uh, we're looking at the Beaver Drive and Sequoia uh, area, along with Red Fur. We're also going to be looking at uh, Juniper Lane, and we're looking also at the Ponderosa Road area. So those areas will have some uh, work going on going in there. Uh, South Century Drive is also an area that we're going to be concentrating on. Um, they had some cable faults in, and we're just going to try to get that stuff put back in uh, and upgraded. Hopefully, um, there'll be little impact to traffic, but we'll, we'll work around everything as we go forward on that one. Um, Streetlights street lights seem like they're an ongoing project for the, for the co-op, but when I got here, I didn't know we had that many issues with streetlights, but uh, you know, we're going to work this year on the Beaver Drive uh, and Pioneer area. We've got a loop in there that's out, um, and what we're actually doing now is we're actually driving the, driving around here at night on the spare time, probably myself, um, mostly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just want to see what lights are on and which lights are off. So uh, we're going to be working there this year and getting that uh, taken care of. Uh, we're also going to be doing some major upgrades at the uh, South Century substation that's down there. Um, we're going to put some new equipment in, uh, new breakers, uh, new electronic equipment, makes it a little bit uh, easier to control. We're also going to become probably unpopular as we're going to actually shut off the parking lot down there that everybody has been using to have garage sale items. And it's how we're going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going to be barricading that off. Uh, with everything that's happening with uh, security at substations and making sure that we're following the, the letter where we should be, we're going to actually find a way to hopefully attractively barricade that off. Um, it might be care bar uh, care barriers to start till we get the fencing in there with slats. But, but we're going to actually get that uh, 
shut down so not everybody's parking there. Um, a couple things, people parking there at the substation, not good, but also access for our crews. We try to get in there and work on the system. Makes it a little rough for us. And then I guess the worst news I've got for you, if you haven't read my back page uh, in the magazine you guys get, is Midstate is doing a facility charge increase this year. We're jumping up to $35 uh, for facility charge. And we're going to be raising our KWH rate um, three mils, which is 0. 0.0003 on your on your power bill kilowatt hour. We lowered it about, uh, I guess it was a year ago that we lowered it. We're still not gonna be close to where it was when we lowered it, we're still down below. But uh, unfortunately, supply chain uh, and the cost of everything, trucking and everything it takes for us to get our product is causing us to actually finally do an increase. The good news is we're still, and I believe as of this last uh, report that I got, we're the second lowest uh, AWH charge in the state. And the facility charge for most co-ops are, are running in the 40s. So Mid-State's still doing its best to keep the power uh, affordable and reliable to you guys. And one last thing, uh, we've been doing a lot on the dams. Uh, if any of you guys have signed up on the Cooperative Voices Power from our website, thank you for that. If you haven't, please do. Um, we had a fight on our hands with the Murray Inslee letter this last year and uh, coming out and removal of the Snake River Dams on the Columbia which would have uh, impacted us all. It would have probably driven your power rates up probably somewhere in that 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So we need to be really proactive on that and keep up. I'd ask that you guys, if you could, haven't signed up, please sign up. It's on our website. The link's right there. Um, and just get part of our grassroots uh, organization where if we need you, we can call you to, to help keep that power coming in as a, as a hydropower, which is definitely green, and we don't want to replace it with a fossil fuel power. So a lot going on at the co-op. I tried to keep it short. Uh, in case there was any questions, but uh, again, we appreciate all of our membership. And if you have any questions, I can take a few. Jim, you're you're also have uh, <clears throat> at least the last time we talked, you had like a 15 year program to um, replace buried cable on Sun River into conduit. Is, mm -hmm. is that still? Yeah, that's still there. With this year, I think we have a quarter million dollars uh, budgeted for cable replacement in Sun River. <clears throat> um, and when we're doing that, we're also installing a fiber conduit in our current conduit. Um, so we're trying to help that out whichever direction that uh, the fiber system goes here. There'll be conduit in the ground that could be either sold or leased off to a fiber company. And that's the high voltage lines, right, between transformers and switches? Correct. What about the the drops to the home? Is that ever going to go into conduit, or is that always going to be a direct ferry? I think, and, and that was difficult. Is as we look at the primary cable, primary cable is pretty point to point. As we start looking at the secondary drops into the home, if there are some that need to be replaced, I think we we definitely want to go into the conduit uh, with that, and at the same time, we can drop a, a spare conduit in. It becomes very challenging on some of these cables out there that people aren't going to want them replaced because of landscaping and other things that yeah. have happened you know over the course from when the cable was originally put in and suddenly we're going to go out there and want to tear up your shrubbery, shrubbery or a water feature or something that's happened out there not going to make us too popular um but uh it's something that we're going to have to probably look at here in the future is those cables are going to fail at some point in time or is that the responsibility of like for cost the but homeowner or the okay but it was something that mid-state depending on the cable um you know we, we might take that case by case and see what could be done because it may need a system upgrade at the same time because the loads have increased um as, as we've got in here we found out with caldera we've made some calculations on load and caldera off the original residences here in sun river and caldera has just smashed those uh, load calculations to where they're probably uh, almost double if not trouble the amount of load that those homes are now using i've got a question the um from a gateway currently from bonneville power and the proposed new one. Uh, is everything from there to the homeowner uh, underground? That will all be overhead. Uh, so the gateway is on that. Uh, transmission cable is, it generates a lot of heat. You go right. underground, you start talking about uh, oil cool cable and a lot of stuff that comes with it. The cost would probably go up to somewhere in the neighborhood of two to like four million dollars a mile for us to replace that cable. So uh, we'll do a overhead cable. Uh, we'll do a steel pole that will kind of weather weather itself and look like a trunk of a tree over a course of about two or three years. Okay. Dig once is a term frequently heard, and there would seem to be an opportunity 
with the work that you're doing to get rid of the direct bearing that's left and results in fault problems from time to time. Um, we have had conversations about working together uh, to try to create a fiber system for some river that would um, well, would be economically feasible and result in community ownership of a system that uh, would allow competitive providers to use the fiber owned by us. And there is currently uh, underway some discussion that could result in funding available that could be applied to accelerate the uh, work that you're doing, getting rid of the fault risk. It would involve um, our purchasing the right to use fiber that you would install and own uh, over a long period of time, and hopefully would provide the level of funding that you had earlier quoted to us as being necessary in order to accelerate the conduit and fiber. Um, would there be interest in further discussion of that? I'm kind of blindsiding you here. Yeah, you're, 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 you're setting me up on this one. So I'm just there. <laughs> I, I know actually, actually, you, <laughs> you, you have history in Douglas County. I do have history in Douglas County and yeah. with Douglas Fastnet. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And there was a recent study done uh, for Douglas Fastnet, well, actually done for Douglas County, that says that they are saving $28 million annually for education, medical applications, and government. And my, my personal experience is uh, starting something in Wasco County as was done in Douglas County. And it took a lot of grasping of straws to get these projects to where they are today, 20 some years later. But the results have been phenomenal. And so I, that's why I'm putting you on the spot because I hate to pass up opportunities <laughs> that uh, save money and increase service. <clears throat> uh, yeah, and so honestly, we did, we conducted, the Mid-State actually conducted a study and had a feasibility study ran on our entire system. Our board of directors is, is pretty adamant that they want it to be all of Mid-State's customers that are served by the fiber build-out um, as they decide what they're going to do. Yeah. Uh, so we went through this. It was pretty rigorous. Uh, the entire build-out of the entire Mid-State system was going to be somewhere around $58 million to get fiber every home in Mid-State. Um, that's a pretty good undertaking for the co-op, um, even if we set up a subsidiary to do it. Um, and with all the RDOF money out there and not knowing exactly what's happening and who's going where, there's a lot of players in the games. I'm sure Dick has told you, Dick is, Dick is on this, probably, he could probably answer this better than I can on the RDOF. But there's a lot of players in the game. And as we're looking at this, we, we're trying to weigh out, or the board's weighing out whether or not you know, Christmas Valley going to be totally served out of Christmas Valley and these, as, as well as uh, Silver Lake or Crescent or which direction it goes. So the, they tabled it pending the outcome of what's going to happen with the current players in the game. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess we've taken, and I get the dick and Rick and saying we're kind of a wait and see approach at this time to make sure, you know, we don't want to overdo anything that could be possibly delivered. Um, and, and and spending our members' money is is always critical, uh, you know, as we look at how we're going to affect the race and what we're going to do with that. But I would say we are still on top of it. We st we're still paying, just staying very much um, in the know. We stay on this every day. I do. I get a lot of emails following to me almost every day from Connexon, who did the study for us, um, which was actually a pretty good study for us to go through. But it, it is a possibility. I would say that we're not totally, we're not shutting the door on it, we're still open to it. Uh, we just kind of want to see where things are going to go. We still want to replace the cable in here. We still want to provide the, the conduit in the ground for, for the fiber because if there is a need in the future, we want to make sure we're not just shutting that off that we might have access to it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank <laughs> you. I would uh, be more than happy to, um, if you guys want to come down and do a presentation to the full board of directors, uh, this is where I get to actually put this back on my board. Um, uh, if you guys want to approach the board and talk to the board about the fiber 
uh, down there. I think it's done a good job. But uh, I would be open to have you guys uh, come across the board of directors down in the state. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, John. One other question about streetlights. I know it's come up in some of our <clears throat> previous meetings. Is it possible to control the brightness of those streetlights? With the particular model we have, and I don't want to quote this, but I know we're using an Evluma product. Evluma did come out with the technology when I was in the Seattle area for the dark sky initiative, where they could turn it down um, and, and uh, lower that output. And that's something I can look into for you and see if we can yeah. lower the output of those down. Because I know, and I think, you know, James, the, the Public Works Department has been putting some you know, louvers on some of those. Yeah, lights. they've been creating um, themselves, um, manufacturing those, the, the little shields that fit up on, on the sides of the fixture yeah. mm -hmm. that keep the kind of the ambient light from going sideways and kind of directed down. So we've been working on those, but you're getting at the overall price. So. Yeah, I mean, and we, we are designated as a dark sky region. We like to keep it that way. Yes, I'm like definitely yeah. All right. And I wanted to uh, be sure that everybody here, well, I think all of us are probably owners uh, of Penn Electric. We are users and appreciate the good work that you are doing and done and will do. But uh, Dick Lutke is on your board. Yeah. He is our representative from Club River and is vice president of your board. He is. And he's very well versed in, in what happens in mid state, and he keeps us well informed. Yeah. No, Dick is probably for a, you know, I've sort of had a lot of board members in my tenure as a, as a CEO and as, as a worker as well, but uh, Dick's probably one of the most engaged board members that we have at times i'm wondering how he has any time to do anything I'm sorry, Dick. But he's, uh, yeah he's he's very in tune to things going on and he doesn't want the opportunities to pass by so he's he's right there for us and we do appreciate it Dick, as we appreciate everybody on the, the owners group would love to see you guys at our annual meeting coming up in may uh so i'll put a plug in for that as well all right any other questions for jim thank you Thank you very much. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Good to see you again. Uh, good to see you again. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, now, now on to more <laughs> exciting topics. <laughs> insurance. Insurance. Uh, so, so, yeah, uh, others introduce Joe Michael. Yeah. So, we have um, Michael Hughes here from Brown and Brown. So, those who have been here for a while, we used to be with Hayes Insurance Company, Randy Hughes, which is father and Michael have been on our account for a long time and so they merged with Brown and Brown about a four years four years ago and they kind of been doing the transition so now everything their offices and everything that they're marketing structures with Brown and Brown uh, so those a couple of years ago no we had we're looking at a really significant increase in our insurance property package uh, mainly due to the wildfire score in Sun River and this area it's something we really had no control over so uh, one of Randy's last salvos was uh, kind of switching that program. We kind of switched the can a little bit on some of the insurance policies to so we one renewal and we were going to save about hundred thousand dollars. What we were looking at that year, and so we some of our policies are on a 10, 10 one renewal. Some of our policies are on a one run renewal. Um, so this year uh, we had a pretty successful. I mean, it's kind of. Hard to say that almost uh, comparing what the prices were, but we were anticipating maybe a little bit more. And so that helped in our last kind of days of the budget process we're getting some of those numbers in. And so Michael's here to kind of give an overview of the renewal and the package. And then we do an annual training for the board, um, kind of go over the DNO and some of those other items. So there's a couple of gentlemen on the on the Zoom that are going to go through a presentation. And so I'll just turn it over to Michael. Great. Thank you, Joe. So as far as the presentation, are you able to pull it up there? I think I'm joined by a few people from the claims and risk team that will have a portion to talk through as well. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm, I'm Michael Hughes with Brown and Brown Insurance, formerly the, the Hayes organization. Today with me is... Jonathan Stevens and then Matthew Koch from our claims and risk team that sit in Portland. Um, we're going to kind of touch on a few items. Do you want to hit the next slide? 
So for those who are new or not familiar, we're going to talk about the team, Brown and Brown in general, the playing community team. Uh, we're going to go over the current placement and a snapshot of the market that sort of led to the placement, maybe some crystal ball predictions uh, for this next year. Um, and then I think in the interest of time, we'll, we'll sort of touch on the executive risk overview and skip over the HOA insurance basics. It's sort of seems like you guys are well-versed in that regard. Okay, so for our team, just again, a snapshot uh, of who works on Sun Rivers account. There's me, and then we have a, you know, a cadre of account managers, account specialists, uh, certificate administrators that help uh, certificates for individual owners. Again, that claims and risk team is sort of the secret sauce for us. It's a seven person team that sits in Portland with us um, that does all sorts of trainings. Uh, they're all licensed adjusters. They work directly with our associations on behalf of the carrier. And then another thing that's a little bit unique about us is we have a marketing department, which is a dedicated five person team that just works directly with carriers and underwriting units to make sure the best products are delivered to uh, our insureds. Okay, just a little bit about the community association practice. So we run runs very large, obviously, we're the fifth largest in the world. Uh, but we are very niche based. We're part of the former Hayes organization that had specialty niches and verticals. Uh, the community association practice is one of those. Um, but our team just focuses on that. We have services, software, trainings, um, all sorts of things that are made available that are specific to large scale associations similar to Center for Owners Association. And I think we're going to have uh, Matt. Uh, and Jonathan talked briefly about some of the services they're able to provide similar associations that are made available to Sun River. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jonathan Stevens with Brown and Brown, a claims and risk manager. And uh, Matt Cook is my associate and we'll be covering some of this subject matter as well. Uh, just to briefly go over some of the claims and risk team services that we offer. As you can see here, we have a seven, actually now nine member team that works on uh, your account. Uh, we have about 160 years experience uh, in the industry. And uh, we will work on different uh, claims advocacy agendas to try and work with your carriers to make sure things are covered and processed in the way that they should and that we feel is in the best interests of the association. Um, we can also provide uh, uh, detailed claims trending analysis. Uh, you folks don't have a whole lot of claims activity, which is a good problem. So it's very easy to uh, document some of those things uh, for you. Uh, we'll go over some of your property and casualty and workers' compensation claims aspects. Um, and then from a risk management perspective, uh, we'll just provide safety and best practices consulting for you to make sure you are aware of and uh, working through the different uh, practices that are most beneficial to you and the rest of your association. Um, as you can see, there's a bunch of other uh, resources that we provide for you. Uh, that can include a lot of online uh, training and things like that. I know Michael and I, I got out there last August and ran with Greg in your facilities through uh, the entire property uh, and things looked very, very good. We spent uh, a great amount of our time at the Shark, which was fantastic and uh, uh, under control uh, much better than one would have anticipated. So your folks are doing an excellent job there and there were very minimal items that we noted. Um, so that's just kind of a thumbnail of some of the claims, resources, and risk management uh, uh, services that we offer. Uh, and so I'll have Matt go over uh, some additional materials uh, at this point. You can keep going now. Sorry, next page. Sorry. Okay. Back, back to you, Michael. Yeah, I mean, we already talked about this. Brown and Brown is very big, obviously, publicly traded. We do benefits, private client. We're big enough that we own London line slips, intermediaries, all that sort of stuff. Again, help leverage that sort of stuff for Sun River and have placements, like Joe had mentioned, to take you out of surplus lines to a nice admin package. Um, and just to zoom out again, these are some similar associations, either in size, scope, number of doors, budget, crazy amenities, errant boards. Um, 
but these are just a, a sampling of some of the large scale associations that we work on and, and partner with in a similar capacity to Sunriver. And they're all over the West Coast primarily. We do a lot in Southern California, Tahoe, Northern California, Scottsdale, um, anywhere that could benefit from services that we're able to provide being as large as we are. And this is the fun part. Uh, so just to touch on some market conditions, nothing's really surprising or changed. You guys see a lot of this in your own homeowners policies, for instance, but uh, it continues to firm and hard in almost every line, the one exception being workers' compensation insurance. Uh, the big thing is weather events, cat events. So if it's uh, wind events in the east, so hurricanes, for instance, or wildfires out here, it moves the needle and impacts um, all insurance. So reinsurance costs goes up, property insurance goes up, the, the ability to offer package insurance diminishes. Um, for instance, uh, the most recent hurricanes, anywhere from 40 to $60 billion loss. Um, Hurricane Katrina, for instance, adjusted for today's dollar was about 90 billion. Um, uh, the winter freeze in Texas, it was $45 billion of loss. That coupled with years of wildfire loss means that you know, property especially is having these crazy reinsurance costs that impact uh, pricing all on the board. Um, as far as the crystal ball for property, I think a great renewal is anywhere between 10 and 18% pure rate increase. Uh, just because they have to recoup the cost of pure reinsurance passed along from reinsurance carriers to the carriers. And just for instance, last year, that was 9%. So in order to replace the same limits, if they're building a big tower, they have to go ask reinsurance and it costs 9% more for the same limit last year. Um, and one big thing with property is this idea of replacement cost. Um, a lot of carriers are trying to get extra rates to get more premium, but they can also do that by selling more insurance. So a higher cost per square foot to get a higher limit of property insurance dovetailed with a rate means you get more premium. So we're seeing that be a big conversation with all carriers running replacement costs for Logic or Marshall Swift for all of their insurers every year now to generate as much premium as they can to make up for those losses. Um, so a proactive approach is good, but again, the carriers will do this anyways. Uh, we are large enough again that we have access to the same software they do when we run it for all of our insurers prior to renewal. <clears throat> Question for you on, sure. um, and Gearher, help me out with this. We learned just yesterday that Sun River now has, is it a risk ranking because of our fire department? Yeah, I, ISO ranking. Uh -huh. Yeah, ISO ranking of two, which I understand is uh, mostly reserved for large cities, but because of the equipment and the manning and the record that we have with our fire department, our ISO ranking is extremely low. Does that affect our insurance? Certainly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like a wildfire score. And so that has a lot to do with distance from fire stations too. So it's just access at that point. Um, but that, I mean, just even from a box underwriting perspective, does anyone even open their books and want to see a certain number? Uh, that didn't even come up. I mean, the wildfire score, we'll talk about that in a little bit, I guess, but the wildfire mapping hasn't really changed in the last two years. So we had that crazy year where it was looked like it was going to go surplus lines and found someone else to do it. But that hasn't really changed. So, I mean, I think that the ISO ranking is, is the exact same. Um, and again, that you know has a lot to do with distance from a fire station, for instance, and access from roads and ingress, egress. Was it the thing? Yeah. And Michael, just to go in on that, that's actually, there's four major areas. As Michael said, the fire department effectiveness, emergency communication systems, water supply, and community risk reduction is how they, that too, that's the four major areas in there. Yeah, for, <laughs> for the other board members who weren't at the SSB meeting, the ranking goes from one to 10. Yeah. One being the best, 10 being the worst. And okay. so we're at two. Uh, we're, we're at two. Bend is at three. Yeah, Bend is at three. So, so we're, we've got a very good rate rating with respect to those four criteria that uh, Matthew just mentioned. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is worth noting too, like back to that property, the property portion, but there's a lot of other associations that are in wildfire area. Tahoe, for instance, is similar terrain. Um, we're seeing a lot of those get completely non-renewed, have shared layered programs with loss limits. I mean, the one example I was used was last year, we worked on a condo association by the lake. Their insurance went from 160,000 property insurance to 1.4 million in a single year. Whoa. And that was a lost limit. That wasn't even replacing the full limit. So that was, I think it was 83 million in total properties. That was for 50 million. Um, they had exterior sprinklers, interior sprinklers, hardened structures, uh, diesel pumps to pull from the lake uh, and still. So I think to your point, uh, the ISO rating plus your own work you do for fire fuel mitigation certainly assists with the good placement you have. And and also 
what's around you outside of your property. If you can work with your neighbors, city, county, or whatever's around you, um, that helps a lot to reduce fire, you know, the underbrush and things like that. That helps your score, even though it's things that you can't control, but working with other folks to get your uh, th that score down too, the firewise score, for example. And just thanks. anything else? I'm, uh, no, thanks. Okay, appreciate it. And then for casualties, so your general liability, auto liability, excess umbrella, um, it's been pretty static. It continues to go up. I mean, four plus years of a, a true hard market. And the thing we're seeing now is um, social inflation being a big driver of that. So it's anti-corporate sentiment basically driving up these jury awards where well, life might used to be one or two million dollars for negligence if you're negligent, maybe a court would award you $2 million for killing someone, basically. Now we're seeing these crazy punitive judgments meant to make the news that are $50, $100 million. But what that means for everyone else is it exhausts all your primary liability limits and it burns through all your umbrella. So these carriers are now, have to, now, now having to actually pay these limits. So we're seeing, I mean, just anecdotally of the 10 large-scale associations we've renewed since 10 one to one one uh, umbrella and earthquake are the two things that have exploded. So anywhere from 15 to 25% rate increase at a minimum, if they want to offer the same limits at all. Um, another thing with casualty is auto, of course, uh, auto liability, distracted driving, everyone's on their phone. Um, and that continues to be a massive issue. And then this idea of elderly, older people driving. Um, and then in truckers, for instance, we're having, uh, no one really wants to drive trucks anymore. They don't have to, they can make as much money doing a different sort of job. So they're lowering, lowering the bar for acceptability for drivers and commercial trucks in turn having more accidents and then it drives up the uh, liability for everyone. So so you, you talk about all these external factors that are affecting our insurance rate. Mm -hmm. Does our record have any bearing on our rate? Oh, certainly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> I, I always try to illustrate this because these are things that are out of your control that right. will impact your rate. And yeah. so, you know, the, the work that you do to stay as safe as you are and claims free uh, to get a below average total increase is what we're trying to target. So flat is always the dream. It's <clears> a hard market too. They have to get their own rates. So property rates have to go up because they have to collect for all the money they spend on claims or have to, have to pay for reinsurance. But again, we'll, we'll touch on the, the actual renewal that we just worked on for 1-1. One, one and um, the results, I think, pretty darn good considering your guys' location and size and all that. Okay. And to add on to that, and I know Jonathan was out with you folks uh, last year. Um, and it's something that, that Jonathan and I and the rest of our team work with Michael. And, and when we go out to the, uh, inspect properties, we're looking at from the eye of what's the carrier look at? What have we seen from the carriers? What are they asking for to help you with those programs to nudge you that way to make you look better the things that you can control. So when Michael and the marketing department talks to that underwriter, we're telling a favorable story for Sun River. We want to tell a great story. Yes, they know where they're at. They know the fire danger in there, but this is what they're doing. These are the programs that they have in place, policies and procedures. So it's all about telling that story for the things that you can control. And those underwriters look at those things. Yeah, thanks, Matt. And I guess one of the reasons I mentioned the ISO rating was I think when you did this analysis, we were probably at three. Probably, uh, yeah. since, since you did this analysis, we have gone down to two, right? <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, and just if I might interject on the uh, as far as uh, how your record affects your insurance costs, uh, just shifting from the property and liability aspect, which we've discussed on the ISO rating, uh, even like on your workers' compensation coverage, uh, you, you guys have an experience mod at 0.62, which essentially means your experience premium, you're paying 62% of what your peers are paying because of your good behavior, uh, which is excellent because work comp can be expensive. And it's also something you can control because it's, it's you. Uh, and so, I mean, as I've relayed to Joe and Keith in the past, you guys only have like three work comp claims a year on the average over the last 10 years and like 1600 bucks a year. So you guys are doing very, very good. And that's why your premium is 62% of your related peers. So that's just another aspect of, of where you can, uh, good behavior is rewarded in that respect. Thanks, Jonathan. I think maybe just for the next slide, um, 
And then as far as the market goes, DNO, directors and officers, it's no surprise. I mean, it's impacted heavily in very litigious states, California, New York, Florida, Arizona. Um, not as much here. We'll talk a little bit more about your guys' existing placement. Um, employment practices is always up 20 to 30 percent, seems like every year. Community associations are a little different because there are so many carriers that are specific and have programs just for HOAs. You're with one of them. Um, it's highly dependent on your claims. Uh, as soon as you get one or two, your retention goes up. Um, but again, from a pure premium perspective and where your dollars are spent, wildfire and liability insurance is where the big focus is, obviously. And cyber, again, it's uh, that's one of the biggest issues. I mean, we're seeing crazy increases for people, even though it's a low dollar figure for the majority of associations, we'll see 400% increases in premium, just because it's impossible to rate for. And then when there is a loss, it can be, I mean, the figure there, for instance, you know, the uh, demand for ransomware in 2020 was 450 grand, and the next year it was uh, 1.2 million. So it's just fake money, insane numbers, but eventually they're paying a million dollar liability limits on those policies, and then they gotta get rates somewhere. Uh, the big thing is MFA, so multi-factor authentication. That's now a requirement to get any sort of policy at all for anyone. Um, so anyone with that's ahead of the curve. If you have to go to surplus lines markets for that, it's 10 times as expensive. Yeah. So again, that'll be something that increases to a point where that'll be a line item as important as your auto liability someday. Yeah. We're in the process of implementing MFA now. Right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and some carriers will have caveats too, where they'll say if it's implemented within 90, 120 days. Yeah. yeah. We've seen that a lot recently, especially. And additionally, some carriers want to work with your IT department um, on what you have, giving you guidance, directions, and we'll take calls from you and, and set up a meeting um, to help you out with that um, as well. Okay, I think we're ready for kind of going. All right. Um, so yeah, here's the. We're, we're going to get into the, the kind of the meat of the presentation. And I know normally we only have a lot more time. So I know we're going to rush through some of the stuff. This is the stuff that we like to show the carriers that we're doing for the boards. And that helps them make them feel good about what Sun River, for example, is doing. And, and Robert, so, you know, let's talk about the roles of a board member. I know there might be some experienced members, some new members. You know, and so the number of board members usually varies from three to seven. And, and always check the bylaws of, each, of your association to, and determine the actual number. Um, you know, positions are similar to any corporate businesses. And usually um, boards are run as such with a rule of order, motions, laws governing the, uh, the running of meetings and communication with other association members. Um, as to what's been voted on and passed. So we want to just make sure we're, we're doing this proper thing. So <clears throat> first up, we're going to have, and in no particular order of importance, um, as a secretary, right? And, and those duties are, are just as important as every other one. They're going to document and, and record keeping are essential for effectively managing these or, your organization. Um, you're going to keep a written record of board decisions and informing members of those decisions. And you're going to ensure that the associations run smoothly. So your main cog, a good cog in this. Um, and, and this is usually the responsibility of the HOA board secretary. So the secretary is going to be responsible for a lot of things. Um, um, as a custodian of the records, the secretary is responsible for creating and maintaining an, um, an archive of all the decisions and changes made to the association. Um, this position entails a lot more than just note taking at a board meeting though um it includes significant amount of liability right because you're gonna be in charge of board communications meeting minutes must be accurate and read and readable right and can be used as an evidence in an event of a lawsuit against the hoa so we're, we're going to be doing or be thorough about it um and, and checking with everything um and knowing the secretary's responsibility, the risk that comes with that position will ensure that your HOA runs effectively um, and that members stay up to date on the association's activities. Um, that, you know, a couple of things, they need to make sure that they're present at all the board meetings. If you're not, you're going to have someone that's acting secretary. Um, if, again, if they're not able to attend, appoint someone uh, to carry out those duties. Um, Recording ac accurate board meeting minutes is the most significant board meeting responsibility in this point. It's going to save you should a DNO or a claim happen, right? Um, also, as the custodian of these records, they're responsible for maintaining and storing all the association's files. Um, that includes the meeting minutes and other important documentation. Like I, during the meeting, I saw things were presented. We're going to make sure we keep those documents, um, <clears throat> as such as the bylaws also and the communication distributed out to all your members. Um, we're also going to talk about um, 
Managing Association. Um, some of the some HOAs out there, not necessarily you, assign the responsibility for managing communications to their secretary. Um, if so, they, these tasks can be simple, um, such as you know publishing the quarterly newsletter, or they can be complex, including communicating with multiple audiences, other board members, homeowners, outside community. Um, <clears throat> so those are just some of the main focus things you can see up on the screen. Um, a little more in-depth detail. So, uh, you know, whoever's going to be elected or appointed volunteer for secretary, it's a very important job. A lot of things to do. So if there's an incoming one, current one, uh, secretary, the president or treasurer we're going to talk about, if you have any questions, you can route them through and then you can route them to us. We'd be more than happy to talk to that person in more detail about their roles and responsibilities in general. So we want to go on to the next one. Treasurer, right? What's the treasurer involved with, right? It's money, right? Annual budget, reserve funds, audit tax returns, insurance coverage, right? Reporting the board on finances and other uh, financial duty. Because, you know, money is a paramount concern for most members of an HOA association. And they want their personal investment, their home protected and maintained. But members also want their fees spent and invested wisely, right? So their, your HOA members are trusting the board treasurer with managing those financial security associations. So we want to make sure we're, we're being responsible with those. Um, so like similar to a CFO of a company, that treasurer has a wide range of duties, right? So, you know, we talked about those are up on the board there. Um, you know, the budget could be simple or complex. You know, they may want to help with an investment ex expert if needed. Um, the tax return consulting is needed. So it's a very important position. And again, I know we were limited on time, so I don't want to get too in depth in there. So if we'll go to the next one, which is our, right, president, right? And you guys folks may have vice president. I think I heard that, right? You're going to preside over the board meetings, maintain, uh, make sure those things are record, make sure the treasurer and secretary are, are doing what they need to do. Uh, you're going to be communicating, uh, with folks and mo monitoring the association on a daily basis, right? Hopefully, um, execute and mo one of the probably most important ones: executing contracts, bank documents, and other legal documents on behalf of the association as its agent, or meeting with your general counsel on things as needed, or Michael with insurance, right? So I, I think people pretty much have a, a good grasp on that. And the next one I wanted to talk about the role of the board of directors. Right, because there's three general responsibilities of the boards. Right, maintaining the common areas. Right, managing bu budget and physical responsibilities, and enforcing complying with government documents. Those are the three areas also where we see the most claims. Right, the biggest issues um, and complaints, and we'll we, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so I know that's a quick high level thumbnail sketch and pretty much the three roles. Um, and we're going to go over to Jonathan, and he's just going to give a quick flyby on HOA insurance basics, I think. Right, Jonathan? Yep. Yeah, so um, just for starters, just kind of an overview on the general types of insurance that HOAs and owners associations would have. Um, of course, you have property and, and liability insurance. You have large uh uh, geography out there, uh, lots of uh, perils, um, but these policies, uh, they can't cover every angle uh, that you experience. Um, so if you stop and think of your association's policy, you might have questions on coverages and how much insurance you have for these. And you have coverage for your autos and your employees and your directors and all these things, which are great questions. Working with Michael can uh, make sure you have the full menu. Um, and so, I mean, with the association, uh, you will want to make sure and cover things like directors and officers liability, commercial auto, general liability, of course, your property, uh, having an umbrella for a rainy day. Uh, and uh, cyber liability, which Michael touched on earlier, which is kind of the big hot button in the industry these days because of how fast technology is advancing and our dependence and uh, also the vulnerabilities that that opens us up to. And uh, with that comes a cost. Um, so that is kind of an overview of some of the general types uh, of insurance. If you want to go to the next slide... Um, 
Uh, we can look at uh, some of what's, uh, I mean, when you, when you look at your official action and function, um, all these interactions can be a source of liability in the community. So some of the policies that get overlooked occasionally can be having comprehensive equipment coverage. Uh, you have a lot of equipment in your various uh, buildings and uh, some of the, the facilities that Greg walked us around last summer. Um, workers' compensation insurance, obviously, is something you want to make sure is shored up. Um, I mean, you have over $4 million in payroll, so that's a lot of employees involved and uh, vulnerabilities to them and injuries. But like I said, you guys are doing very, very good uh, in keeping yourselves um, safe and injury free. Uh, you also uh, want to make sure you have proper employee dishonesty coverage, discrimination coverage. Uh, the world is a different world than it was when we were all younger. And so it's important to have that uh, uh, area covered. And then just comprehensive general liability insurance in general. Uh, and uh, Michael's going to cover uh, a lot of these things uh, at the end just to show you what insurance you have, who it's with, how much it's costing, and what type of protection that gives you. So that's kind of the, the flyover uh, overview on some of your coverages there. Thanks, Jonathan. And so we're going to move into you know, what is actual uh, HOA or Home Association Directors and Officers Insurance? You know, it's nearly impossible um, to satisfy every homeowner. Uh, so when a homeowner grows angry or unsettled, uh, there's a there's a potential for an HOA and its board to be at risk. So, you know, what is it covered? It's, it's a separate policy that fills in gaps from your general liability policy. So it's a completely separate policy. Um, it's for the protection of the board, right? Um, for the board only. And it will protect individual board members by name right, usually, and but generally it will not cover, and this is general overview, uh, you know, generally not specific to your very specific policy because the wording is different, every scenario is different, but generally it will not cover past members who are no longer serving. But as Michael will probably mention, we can list those past members on the policy or attempt to as well. And it covers legal costs um, and damages in case a homeowner sues them, um, you know, it, you know, it covers the directors, officers, trustees, and and sometimes employees, right? Um, sometimes it does not because um, they're not a director or an officer. Um, but under under your your policy, um, these wrongful acts mean an actual alleged error, misstatement, misleading statement, act, omission, negligence, or breach of duty committed or attempted by a an insured person in the capacity of such or any matter claimed against insured persons solely by reason of serving in such capacity I, on mm -hmm. the board, right? The named entity or subsidiary property manager, but solely in the capacity as a property manager performing property. Oh, issues. Practice or wrongful personal injury. There we go. There you, go. There you, go. you froze for a second. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I was just reading what was on the policy. I can do it again. It's extremely boring, but it talks about what a wrongful act is. So what it boils down to is you're going to get a lot of, and if we go to the next one, the next slide, before I go into that, that my rant, you know, what's generally not covered, right? Things that are not covered on here, you know, at every scenario is different. Doesn't mean it's going to be one of the things happen is automatically de uh, denied. It's we're going to want to turn that in and only let that carrier make that decision. And then if they do deny part of it, we'll then act as a coverage advocate to see what's going on and working with, say, if you have your general counsel and us involved, what we can do. Um, and, and every policy is a little different, uh, but those are generally what's not covered. I don't see a lot of um, these claims out there uh, in the HOA world, what I do see is what's coming up next, the common sources of claims. And even then, I'm not seeing a lot of these lately. I'm seeing a lot of things like um, increased wage and hour litigation, right? And wage stuff laws, if you have employees, or I'm seeing a lot of um, um, issues relating to independent contractor status and related litigation, 
right? Or, or is this person an independent contractor or third party claims? Or I'm seeing a lot of um, claims. We'll, we'll pick California, we'll like to pick on them and their drought and claims that you've hurt my investment in property value because you're mismanaging the landscaping and the grass is brown and the bushes are dying and therefore I've suffered a financial loss, right? So we're seeing a lot of things like that that are turning in, that we're having to turn in as a claims because that person's actually claiming a financial loss versus um, someone's not following the rules because they're barbecuing or they're using dryer. And these are all things that I see. They're using uh, laundry softener discs and the community washers and they're causing a scent or they're playing music too loud on the beach, but you're allowing them to have concerts at their house or, uh, or not uh, equally enforcing, um, you know, covenants or rules. That's what we're seeing uh, mainly um, <clears throat> lately, believe it or not, or some sort of liability related to um, facilities, a lake, um, a, a boating incident, um, things like that. So it's not necessarily some of these things, but it's what we're seeing. That's almost like an everyday, if I lived in a normal non HOA, a city, right. Or a park, because you do have rows and parks and lakes and things like that. So Jonathan, anything else on that? that oh, just, seeing? I wanted to just wanted to spotlight the right there in the middle. Um, one that could come up because uh, your association is a microcosm of the, the bigger world. So you're a neighborhood of your own, but uh, selective enforcement. Uh, as a board, you are choosing to push an agenda or step back on an agenda. Uh, whatever your policies are, you want to follow them pretty close to the letter. Uh, because if you don't, and then you do, somebody's going to get their feelings hurt and think, oh, they're picking on me. So that's a big one in the modern day you want for appearances only even, but also for the legality, be the same for everyone and then nobody complain. So that's just one I wanted to highlight because we're in the 21st century and that's where we are. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So we're just going to move on to the duties, duties of the board. And we're, I think all three of us are going to share in this, but I just want to, you know, talk about, um, the, uh, you know, being the duty, uh, what is it? Uh, you know, we're worried about people are like, I'm usually worried about per being personally liable or acting in good faith. Well, there are some federal volunteer protection act out there, 1977 and state volunteer immunity laws providing some protection for volunteers working for a nonprofit board. Right. But nothing in the law prohibits director's office from being subject to a lawsuit. So that's why we buy that extra insurance, right? And all state immunity laws have holes in them, right? So some only protect volunteer directors and officers and not employees, right? Uh, and some require that the DNO directors officers have acted in good faith within the scope of their duties to avoid damages. So allegation, uh, right? And, and then most accept reckless, wanton, gross, and intentional acts. So that's why it's important that when we have talk about acting good faith or, or fail or dealing we're we're you know avoiding conflicts of interest situations so if i'm on the board i'm also a contractor i probably not going to participate in a bid process at all or maybe um you know to avoid any uh, allegations or any wrongful conflicts or allegations or improprieties um you know, if you're, say, a doctor or a lawyer, you, you know, you, you have these ethic things and classes we, you know, insurance agents we have to take. And I discuss these all the time with my wife, who's a licensed social worker, and decisions we make every day are based on do we want any, you know, imp illusions, regardless of what's not. So we want to avoid those to make sure we're, we're working on, uh, you know, are doing our due diligence and care and we're following our charters and articles and bylaws. Um, following good business, you know, judgments, right? Following our duties, you know, doing what we're supposed to do because we don't want to fall within that, right? That uh, loopholes or those laws. Uh, Michael, uh, something on that you wanted to add? Okay. Well, I just want to, if we're, I think we're sort of out of time, but I want to go to the current placement. I know we're only supposed to take up about a half hour and I think we're just over, but maybe just, uh, again, it should be noted that anything that's in this training or specific to DNO, You'll have the presentation or contact information so you can reach out to any three of us to get a deeper dive on any of that or claims examples for any of these duties, for instance. But I think just to make sure we touch on the placement, which is the meat and potatoes, we'll just go to that next, if that's all right. Sure. Okay. Yep. Um, okay. 
So I think I, there should be a pamphlet or the pamphlet that was handed out has a PRC, which is a premium rate comparison. It's a different way to basically look at the renewal. Um, this is a little bit more information because this contains um, those policies that did renew on 10 one, so October 1st, and the ones that just renewed a few weeks ago, just on uh, 1231. But this is the totality of the insurance of the place uh, on behalf of Sunday by Brown and Brown. Uh, again, those two split X dates are because of, or renewal dates uh, are because of that cancel rewrite to find the much cheaper insurance through that resort card slash Amlin program. Uh, as Joe had suggested, it saved hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we're very pleased that Resort Guard was able to trade and partner and open their books. Um, uh, the renewal was, uh, in my opinion, pretty darn good. Uh, the premium rate comparisons far this column illustrates the rate. Um, and the intent of that is to show the difference between exposure and rate change for the renewal. So exposure being if you add vehicles, of course, your insurance is going to be more expensive this year. If you buy more property insurance, of course, it'll be more expensive. But the rate there is the increase directly from the carrier itself, uh, regardless of exposure change. And it kind of felt, you know, pretty much right in line with what we thought with the big difference being uh, the rate increase in the property was much lower than we initially anticipated. with a blended rate of 5.6% on the property, which we think is excellent uh, for wildfire subject property, especially with a carrier like Resort Guard slash Amlins. Uh, beyond that, well, general liability is up 16%. It's on the higher end, but again, it's offset by package pricing on the property. Uh, you know, all in all, we, we feel pretty darn good about the renewal, um, especially considering our initial crystal ball outlook, outlook this time last year wasn't as rosy because uh, we, we thought there would be a heavy wildfire season, the optics of which would severely impact the underwriter's willingness to offer a great renewal. Um, and then those policies that renewed on 10-1, it's primarily your executive risk, those things we were talking about. So your directors and officers, um, fiduciary, uh, cyber liability, um, and then your crime policy and workers' compensation as well. Jonathan had touched on that as, as well. What's the difference between directors and officers and professional liability? That um, professional liability, I don't remember what that one's for. I think that professional that's for the, uh, like the, the work we do, the service district. Oh, that's right. Things that we have live, we have insurance to cover those professional services that we provide to others. Yeah, that's right. And then what's the difference between umbrella and excess liability? So the excess liability sits on top of the umbrella. So it's, it's so there's a, a the $5 million resort card is the umbrella they provide. And then Scottsdale does a five on top. Um, so you have a $10 million total excess limit and two layers, the resort card primary 5 million and Scottsdale five on top, which sits over um, the general liability, the auto liability, the workers' compensation, and not the directors and officers, but you do have a higher primary limit of it. We have a $2 million limit of directors and officers. Well, that's one thing that's being restricted a lot is we're seeing a lot of excess slash umbrella carriers not offering to sit on top of uh, directors and officers any longer. So we're suggesting buying higher primary limits to compensate, especially for an organization your size. So that's errors and um, errors and omissions insurance, basically. So which one was that? DNO, the directors and officers. No, so the, the DNO it's, it's the policy that covers your guys' actions as a board member acting on behalf of the association. So if there's some sort of judgment made by you that causes a claim, that will cover your action. I'd like to know who signed or acknowledged the. Um, of using Scottsdale as a non-admitted carrier. Um, you mean as far as AM best rating? No, I know they're not rated, but they're a non-admitted carrier. Mm -hmm. Who approved that from SROA? I think it was signed post binding. So it was a diligent search form that signed after we go out to market. I mean, we actively marketed that with two different intermediaries. One, AM wins obviously another one called RLA. Um, from a pricing standpoint and being pure exit, that was the best one we could find. And of course, it meant what that- What the next best thing? I, I'm not comfortable with the non carrier period. I'm an insurance broker. Okay. Um, I, I'm not, I'd have to look at the marketing list to see if there was even another option. Um, I mean, at, at the point that we were trying to build that tower, we're obviously very price sensitive and I mean, and it's anecdotal, but again, Almost every one of our large scale associations has some portion of the umbrella that's not admitted for an association this size with all the exposure that's in place. It's nearly impossible to find anything more than a 5 million primary that's fully admitted. I mean, for instance, we're the biggest writer of Philadelphia insurance in the entire West Coast. We only have two of our 40 associations within that they do 10 on 10, 10 million. So it's sort of like 
you could maybe get something admitted for, I don't even want to guess, double for the five over five. Um, but again, it's got to be, if, you know, if you're price sensitive, for instance, or it's a financially stable community and you're okay spending the extra money for the admitted status, that's sort of the, yeah. Do you have a formula that you're using as to how to predict how much liability? Benchmarking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we use advising, of course, and then Brown & Brown, again, is big enough where we can aggregate all the information in our, our agency management system. Mm -hmm. We think the actual, like the absolute baseline for a large-scale association just industry-wide is 10 million, which is where you guys are now. And with pricing going up the way it has, we're thinking it's it can be hyper expensive to replace 20 and 30 million dollar umbrellas we only have maybe five associations that buy more than 20 right now mm -hmm. and they either don't have as much risk or maybe they have amenities controlled by a golf and country club component that's not there so they just have maybe a clubhouse or an admin building and that's it no streets and roads but for the the amount of exposure that sroa has we think 10 million is the baseline we would recommend this is not easy to put this package together. Oh, I know. Yeah. I've worked with a lot of winery accounts. And yeah. it's similar. It was very, very difficult. And the alternative was about an extra four or 500,000. Yeah. So we actively marketed too. So in order to get this result, I mean, we didn't just renew the resort card option. We actively worked with our marketing department to talk to other carriers. Mm -hmm. The biggest riders for us with West Coast associations is Philadelphia Insurance, Allianz Travelers, mm -hmm. of course. Um, and Resort Card is a great partner as well. Um, but, you know, we went out to market and they said, is Re Resort Card offering renewal terms? Uh, once we got buying from them, everyone else said, if they're offering mm -hmm. terms, find that as fast as you can. Thank you, Marsh. I have one other question. Sure. On the property list, it had the sledding hill. What's 50,000 in the sledding hill? So we're removing that from the insurance because we're not using it anymore. Uh, right. That was you know, the, the materials that are on the sledding, the never plants and those type things that were on the reserve study too. But that's gone. I know, but yeah, we, we just removed that removed. basically after we did the renewal. That we did the renewal when we were just making that decision. So, so that's that that been requested yeah. to be deleted then? Yeah, we can take that out. Yeah. Oh. yeah, we can process that as soon as we're back. Um, anything else on that? the premium rate comparison of that first slide. Just, I guess for the last thing here, I know we're a little bit over time, but is just, this is the snapshot of your guys' current, you know, um, policy in place, the CNA, it's through one of those carriers I mentioned that's specific to associations. Um, it's a $2 million primary limit. So yes, it doesn't go under the umbrella, but you have a higher primary limit than the majority of other large scale associations. A um, couple of things to note, uh, you do have third party EPL and um, Defense is outside the limit, which is a big thing. Uh, basically, it means it's not going to erode limit for defense. Um, is there any specific questions anyone had? I know I covered it, we covered a ton of stuff, tried to kind of fit it in. So, I mean, as an insurance broker who works with multiple homeowners associations, mm -hmm. Uh, similar to SROA, um, is it correct, would it be correct for me to say that you feel uh, we are adequately insured for the assets and perils that we face? I think you need the benchmark for sure. Again, the only thing, I mean, you can move the needle on certain things like a higher umbrella limit. You can choose to buy different limits or earthquake if you want. Um, it's just a the idea of price sensitivity. We have a lot of insureds that are not financially stable and have to move dollars around to replace fire insurance. Mm -hmm. um, we're always able to extend and get different quotes, sublimits, all sorts of things to, to expand your existing coverage. But I think I wouldn't go lower than 10 million on your umbrella, especially for the amount of risk you have with a shark, yeah. for instance, um, streets and roads, that sort of thing. Um, you could explore higher limits, but it would, it would just cascade up and be even more expensive for your umbrella. Um, so is it not as good going with a $10 million umbrella as it was going with the $5 million umbrella and $5 million excess? 10 was not even offered. So the 10 is not it. Yeah. So I was. And the second one is not in there. So, I mean, if, if, if we wanted to, we could go with the $5 million <clears throat> that's covered by a basic liability and then purchase another $15 million or something like that. Yeah. I mean, we could, we could find limits up to 
we, we could do a fifty million dollar umbrella. It's just right. the pricing would be right. hyper expensive. Yeah. That would all be non admitted yeah. at this point. But but if <clears throat> I, I think what you're telling us, if I understand it correctly, if a wildfire comes through Sun River mm -hmm. and wipes out <clears throat> all of our facilities. We have ten million dollars worth of insurance. Oh no, no. So that's the, that would be your property limit. So your property limits determined through that replacement cost estimation software that's run by the carrier, and then we can do it too and give you the results. But uh, your total property limit is nineteen point one million dollars. Okay, so there's there's nineteen million dollars on property, and then excess liability is the ten million. Yeah, that's the light. That's just the the umbrella that sits on top of your your general liability, your auto liability. So if there is. Not so that umbrella, uh, Michael Edelstone, so that's going to be, I I have a bar restaurant and I may overserve maybe a, a guest, a homeowner, and that homeowner gets in their golf cart and then rolls the golf cart, hit, swerves something, hits uh, an embankment, rolls down, and it's now a quadriplegic, for example, right? You, your primary limits are going to be coming to play. And then obviously due to the nature of injury, we're going to notify that excess carrier Right for this excess or any possible coverage or issues that you may have had. That fire, it may be you have your property, it's not going to cover them, but maybe there's a reason that Sun River did something wrong during that. They they had their fire pumps off, or you know, we're in charge of the fire hydrants and we're not maintaining them, so we couldn't fight the fire. Maybe at that point you would throw something into your general liability and put your, your umbrella on there. But your umbrella doesn't have to do anything with the property, it's something separate. It's gonna be something that the Sun River did themselves right, right okay yeah and that, that property limit is always important especially for places that are in a wildfire area because the idea of spread of risk is not it, it, there used to be this idea of spread of risk in wildfire areas where even if there was a fire it wouldn't impact all buildings you could have a blanket limit to apply at any one location those days are done so that's why we try to approach uh, a really good adequate replacement cost limit for your property every single year okay any other questions or comments or returns, Faulkner? I would just have kind of a question for us, real comments that uh, without getting too much in the weeds or too wonky, how do we share information with our homeowners about the challenges? I mean, I think there was an art when we had, we had that big insurance. I think we put something in the scene yeah. that there was, you know, we the well Philadelphia at that point was not going to carry us any further. And then we were so we got a lot of calls from homeowners asking about that. And asking about their oh, it's tough here. Yeah, I just kind of an update of what yeah. Joe's talking about without getting too wonky. Mm -hmm. we're, we're happy to We do that for other associations all the time. If there's an owner's forum or if you guys just want a state of the market update so we can, I think it helps inform people and lets them know to not be blindsided because of course everyone sees it in their own homeowners. But I mean, we process uh, quarterly state of the market reports regardless. And so we have that information. We're happy to present it at any time. Uh, one quick question. Does the DNO insurance cover anybody in the committees at all? Yeah, hundred percent volunteers. Okay, given what they mentioned about the DNO insurance only covering active members of the board, it kind of is a great incentive for continuing to <laughs> be a board member so you fall over. Yeah. Well, you know, it is an occurrence policy, so when it occurred, you were on the board, you're okay, right? Uh, if yeah, you're off the board, you know, you want to stay on the board forever. So yeah, there you go, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that's what i've been trying to get off the safety committee chair for the last 12 years i understand your plight all right uh thank you thanks everyone. folks and, and appreciate the uh the detail and uh the hard work in getting us the policies that you did get us yeah, thanks for the end of the partnership we look forward to another good year and delivering good results all right thank you all thank you all I know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Nick, we've got Holly Hendricks uh, from the nominating committee. Holly, welcome. Did you take a break or anything? <laughs> not yet. No, 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 not yet. No, no, no. <laughs> Push on. We're used to long meetings. Okay. Used to them or have them. <laughs> used to having them.
Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, my name is Holly Hendricks, and this year I'm chair of the nominating committee. Uh, last year, the former chair of the nominating committee, Pat Hensley, came to you and um, presented a board that had some recommendations that the uh, nominating committee could work on. And one of those is uh, updating the board application. <clears throat> so that's why I'm here today. Um, the current application is edited yearly to include current dates, uh, but it seemed uh, to our committee that it, it needed a little bit of refreshing. So four members of the nominating committee um, volunteered to take a look at the existing application. That's Steve Aloya, Ron Angel, Mike Applegate, and myself. Um, we met for several meetings and made revisions. We wanted to reconcile the application to the governing documents. Um, we wanted to, we changed the, the title of the document to uh, board member candidacy application. We gave the SROA logo and mission statement uh, prominent placement on the cover. We added a one page overview section and set out a checklist for documents that needed to be completed and returned in order to have a complete application. Um, although it seems to be a lengthy document, the information in it is necessary uh, for the nominating committee to complete its screening uh, function. And the document also, the application also communicated to, um, to someone, you know, what are the, what are the realities of board service, the time commitment, the, you know, the, um, the details, or it gets closer, I think, than the existing. We asked SROA staff, um, James and Becky, to please review the, the uh, revised application for accuracy because they're very important partners in this whole process. And then in December, the, the entire nominating committee uh, reviewed the document and um, approved its form and submission to you for your review and approval. I just have an update because in January, after we had submitted the proposed uh, application, in January, we had our meeting with legal counsel and um, he recommended that we begin implementing the criminal background check. So um, I'm gonna come back or someone will come back next month or thereafter with the process, you know, after our committee has been able to review uh, a form and a process, then we'll come back to you for approval. But that seems like a, a good, you know, kind of corporate governance hygiene activity that we should begin, we should be doing with every candidate. Uh, so I'm here to respectfully request that you approve the revision to the uh, application. Okay, any questions for Holly? I have a couple of questions. So um, on your overview page, and um, I have two concerns in there. Um, the very first uh, candidacy requirements, uh, number two, the ability to work collaboratively and resolve complex issues. Uh, that was changed from the previous that said address them. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how well we're always able to resolve the complex issues. Mm -hmm. I think we try to address them, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm wondering about that uh, discussion on that change of wording is one of my questions. I think what the what we were um, wanting to communicate to an applicant is that this is this is a team activity that you're doing. And uh, to be able to work together as a group to try and come through, maybe resolving or maybe not resolving. Um, the the point is um, being able to work together or attempting to work together. Well, I like the collaborative. My only question is whether yeah. we should say address complex issues or attempting or yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or address <laughs> slash resolve because I, the issues keep reappearing and reappearing and reappearing. So I'm not sure we resolve them. As I agree group. with Clark. I mean, we don't vote nine zero on everything, right. but we do have active discussions on these things. Right. 
which is what we should be doing. <clears throat> and a vote, uh, when we finally take a vote, does resolve it. Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. Well, it addresses well, I mean, it, I think. Yeah, it's like it probably addresses it. Addresses we don't it. solve the problem. Yeah. And I re, uh, resolve tends to suggest we solve it. And uh, maybe I'm wrong. I'm not a linguist. Well, you and I don't agree on everything, but I agree with you on this one. <laughs> <laughs> and then my other one is under time commitment, the third Friday and Saturday of the month. It's really confusing here, even as a board member. And I, to my third year, I finally took it, get it straight. It's a third Saturday, and then it's whatever the Friday. The Friday could be the second Friday of the month. The prior Friday. Because I occasionally get screwed up in my schedule, but I put in the third Friday and and Saturday, and all of a sudden, whoops, that's not the week. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and of course, board members will learn that, but um, it, maybe it's not important on this list. But uh, and, and well, it'd be, be good to be clear about yeah. that. Yeah, it's the third the, Saturday and, and the prior, prior Friday. 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 Yeah. 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 Monthly meetings on the third Saturday and the prior Friday. Yeah. And the previous Friday. Yeah. Or prior Friday. Friday. Prior Friday. Proceeding. Yeah. Yeah. Proceeding. Third Saturday. Proceeding. Prior proceeding is going to be proceeding. Yeah. Yeah. Previous. There you go. Proceeding Friday. Okay. Unfortunate thing. When you're trying to put it on your calendar. You, you yeah. can't do that in Outlook. I know. It's, you got to go through it to correct it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can make those, those changes. Also under time commitment, the third one, each director participates in a committee and or task force. Mm -hmm. uh, the singular Kind of doesn't work out that way. You need um, a minimum of a minimum of a one, yeah. or, or in committees or task forces yeah, as a scroll for you. Can the committees with S in parentheses? Yeah. 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 And task forces. And it may expand past that. Gearhart and I are on another board. Definitely. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, um, I agree with the uh, background check. In so we could call, the, the rules talk about the five year felony thing. Well, if you don't do a background check, you have no idea whether any candidate had a felony in the last five years other than self, okay. self disclosure. Yeah. Do we have tools we use for that for SROA or for, uh, yeah, for SROA employees? James? Yeah. Do we use Nexus Nexus or do then to go back? I don't like Kelly answers. Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. Good. I have kind of a, a, a question, maybe unrelated to this. Um, uh, as we're getting interviewed with um, potential applicants, candidates. Um, one of the things I wonder about is because we typically do town halls or owners forums if there's how we do we approach are you and you commit to participating in that i think it's fair to owners to know to be able to see what the candidates are how they respond um but i don't know if we can do that through your committee you may require a candidate to no, participate. Just, yeah, um, as a requirement, I don't think you can. Well, that's the way it is. Yeah. I mean, if it's well, not required, then they have the option to do it or not. Well, sure. some way, well, hear me out. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way to convey the the value and importance of participating in a forum? Not as a requirement. I'm not saying that. Um, are you suggesting attending meetings or? Well, a, there's just the candidate forum is the only one you're talking about because the other forums we do specific to the topic that's being addressed. Yeah, specific to the candidate forum. Right. You're talking about the Sun River Youth candidate forum. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I yeah. think the, in the past, I think the Women's Club has has done it, but now they don't want to do something yeah. that is politically tinged. The Men's Club, I think in the past, or Rotary, May have done a forum. Rotary has done it, and but that's outside the scope right. of the nominating right. committee. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That yeah. just gets it out into the world, and yeah. I think that's probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think last year um, that the F, the Sun River U forum I think was really valuable, and one of the candidates didn't participate, yeah. but he also you know wasn't elected. Yeah. So maybe that's the consequence of 
not being willing yeah. to participate. I think it is becoming more and more important um, as we do it. More and more people are watching it yeah. and paying attention to someone that doesn't come. And it is valuable to learn. And it's one method of learning, but the requirement to do it or not yeah. is kind of a questionable thing. I don't know if the nominating committee can require it. Well, yeah, 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 maybe yeah, but... it is just like her bill said, the importance is important is that you stress with candidates. That's right. right. That this yeah. is an important factor yeah. and it could affect your electability. Yeah. 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 It's, and you know, that's all you can do. Running for you can't make it mandatory. There's you can... one thing running your campaign is a whole separate sure. issue. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll give you an example. I missed one of the um, forums because I had to take my father to a cancer treatment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, Given the two, I'm, I'm going to be a dad at that, yeah. at that issue. And so I missed that um, mm -hmm. uh, event. Uh, it wasn't that I wanted to, but I did. Um, but uh, yet I'm still here. So yeah. Well, you were awarded with the top uh, position, one of the most votes. Well, there is that. <laughs> so people do. You're a good son. <laughs> That's the bottom line. <laughs> Anything else? Anything else for Holly? Thank you for all your work. Yeah, thank oh, you, Holly. Well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think it's. Uh, I think what you guys do is is very important, very valuable, and not easy. Real quick, this is a an action item tomorrow, and so you asked for a couple of changes. So Holly, not to put pressure on you. I can go home and if you can do it and send it to me, and then I'll. Give it to you tomorrow yeah. for both. That'd be yeah. great. Thanks, Holly. All right. Next on the agenda is SSD Police Department, Lieutenant Lopez. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, I believe we forwarded, and it should be in front of you, the preliminary policy that we have written along with uh, the uh, the proposed purchase order so you know exactly what this pertains to. So brief history, um, approximately six months ago, we started working on a, and we put together a, a group to look into the feasibility of a UAS program or locally a drone program for the police department here in Sun River. Uh, part of that was initial training at a symposium that we sent an officer to, as well as conversations both with the uh, SSD board, as well as neighboring agencies, as far as their programs and capabilities. To go even further back there, to put in perspective for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, police drone programs, uh, referred to as UAS programs here, um, it has become best practice, standard practice, uh, in definitely West Coast uh, Police Departments and specifically Central Oregon Police Departments to utilize drones um, for a variety of different purposes. Uh, in this county alone, Bend Police Department has drone capabilities, Deschutes County has drone capabilities, Redmond has uh, drone capabilities. Um, when we looked into it and, and put our heads together as far as what these drones could potentially be used for in the community, uh, we looked at our call volume and the type of call that these could potentially be used for and found that these would be utilized and uh, primarily for um, our missing persons, um, which um, also for um, suspect apprehension and, lo and location. Um, and, um, and those are the primary purposes as well as search and rescue. Uh, obviously not as uh, you frequently uh, use, but however, is a concern here. And also for, um, could be used in collaboration with uh, Sun River Fire and Rescue in structure fires, wildland fires, uh, to get a 360 view and a better um, idea of their response and our response to evacuations and things like that. Um, we currently uh, are sitting on a grant that funds a portion of uh, the money needed to upstart our uh, program. However, before we move forward, we wanted to bring to you um, a request to give us an exemption in the rules and regulations uh, and to operate our drones uh, in approved pre-planned operations and in operations uh, that fall under exigency, meaning that there's risk to life or, or uh, limb, um, and we need to fly the drone. 
currently as you have any examples where you may have been able to use this recently yes that been helpful? Thanks for me up. <laughs> um, the, um, I was getting there uh, I was getting there uh, for recently in the last two months uh, there were three examples where we um, a drone would have been beneficial first uh, a a thief from the North store um, ran into the woods um, and my officer made the correct decision not to chase someone into the woods alone. Uh, would have been beneficial for us to uh, use the drone at that time to try to locate him safely um, and at least identify him. Second, uh, unfortunately, uh, we responded to um, a homeowner who was suffering from Alzheimer's who had wandered uh, off in off and we had no idea. Um, we requested drone response from Deschutes County. I was 30 minutes away. By that time, we had found him. Um, but thankfully, thankfully, but that is a unfortunately a, a relatively common call to go to. Third and most exciting, um, we uh, last month uh, we responded to suspicious activity. Uh, long story short, um, my officers tracked a burglar who we eventually arrested uh, for three hours through the snow on foot um, and lost him, but then found him again. <laughs> um, and arrested him. However, a drone would have probably kept my officers from hiking uh, a mile in the snow and probably would have resolved it faster so I could have gone to sleep. So, um, <laughs> the, um, so those are just three in the last couple months. Now, in the summer months, uh, I would anticipate a drone would be used uh, not frequently, but more frequently as we get the missing kids calls as we get um, incidents on the river, which we do respond to, uh, will give us an opportunity to actually see what's out there. Um, and uh, and we have the population growth. So those are just three in the last couple of months that we would utilize them for. So what we're requesting is consideration to amend the rules or give us an exception to the rules so that we can actually take off and land our drones here in Sun River, which is prohibited uh, now and instead of coming to you and waking James up in the middle of the night to ask permission or get an exemption, we'd like that just uh, to have that exemption on the books so that we can operate our program. Would there be training runs that have to be run in Sun River in addition to the actual use of the devices? Yes. Yeah. So there's extensive training that is actually budgeted into our upstart. Um, you can't just assign an officer. They need to uh, go through FAA training, through drone pilot training. They need to be certified. We need to put our drones uh, through um, uh, the Department of Aviation. They need to be registered. Um, and then there's extensive training on where they can fly, FAA regulations, how they can fly, in addition to our own policies and ORSs that pertain to privacy laws. Mm -hmm. So they would be flying occasionally. Uh, however, that lift is spread amongst our regional partners so that um, there's training in Bend and then training in Redmond and it rotates um, occasionally. Would, I don't would, foresee I mean, would there be training runs in Sun River? Yes. There would be. Occasionally they will need to learn how to fly it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just as you know, anything else, we have annual training on cars and everything. Else. Would they be launching from here then? Yes. Okay. So that's why we need the exemption. Um, you know, the Sun River rules state that it doesn't say about the drone in the air, but it does mention that you cannot take off or land a drone in Sun River. Right. We need that. Um, we would be taking off and landing primarily from the back of our vehicles. If I could real quick on that is that our rules uh, prevent the takeoff and landing under FAA rules. You can fly a drone in Sun River, you just, under our rules, you cannot take off and land in Sun River. So if you were outside of Sun River proper, you can take off and land and you can fly throughout Sun River. Mm -hmm. So here, and, and, and regularly, just I guess related to this, is we get requests that I have to sign off on um, for an exemption, like you're talking about. We have realtors that want to do a half an hour over a house to take photos um, for advertising. We get the resort, we'll have a function or some marketing so we'll sign off on those. Those are short in duration, um, but we don't want to go have to go through that process every time. I, I mean, if it's an emergency, we don't have the ability to do that. So it would be a rule. What's the ceiling on these? Uh, you would use? They see they, these current capabilities, they can go relatively high. However, we're capped by policy and um, uh, 400 feet, something along those lines. Uh, I don't have it exactly in front of me because I'm not going to be the operator. 
Yeah, it's 400 feet. Yeah. Maximum above ground is 400 feet. So no interference with the airport or anything. It'd be an interference with the airport. The airport, yeah. we've had discussions with the airport. And uh, we, they're in, we do the extensive training that <coughs> law enforcement drone operators have to go through. Um, there's no concerns there. Uh, drone operations are conducted in Bend and Redmond. Now, Redmond is an international airport, which is has a tower, which um, adds to some restricted space. However, the Bend operations have been conducted um, in the vicinity of uh, other airports and other facilities, as long as the rules are, uh, are followed and the trained operator and observer are in place, I don't feel that there is any um, substantial risk in that in that uh, area. Okay. Two questions. We don't actually have a policy amendment in our package today. Is, is that something we're going to have tomorrow? Yeah, uh, no, and that's what I was going to jump into. It doesn't, it doesn't require an action by you, basically an authorization or direction to forward this to the Covenants Committee to look at the rule change. Um, if you do that, just taking it through the timeline, um, and we talked to Lieutenant Lopez and Chief Wilmer about this. Um, in February, the Covenants Committee could consider this change. It would be very short and brief on the rules. Come back to you at your February meeting for first reading, 60-day comment, and April, it could have second reading and go into effect. When the police department want to have it in April? And you know, and just training and there are there is a, a a consideration that we need to send our people through the proper training. Um, so I don't feel um, that we'd be getting this up and and going any earlier than that to get them to the proper training, to get them to the regional training, and to um, and to act, quite frankly get it out into the community so they know um, why why we have that. Just in general, though. There used to be a rule that uh, takeoff and landings from the airport had to be on the other side of the river. And uh, it seems like they're not complying with that anymore. Uh, they're coming straight over our house. The, of the airport or yeah, the, of the planes at the airport? Oh, the yeah. Drones. Not the drones. Oh, I'm just thinking that it would be safer if they complied with the rule of takeoff and landing <laughs> they have on the a, other side of the river. They have a... I, been a, this has come up a couple times, and I've spoken with Brandon, who's the manager of the airport. They have a it's a it's a it's not a rule, but there's a flight path, a flight plan for right. takeoffs and landings that direct them to the west. But there is no rule, there's no penalty, there's nothing that requires a pilot to not fly over some river. There's flight patterns, but individual pilots uh, sometimes it might be their first time in some river. Uh, they may not be looking at that until they actually have eyes on the airport and then they're radioing in and they may not have done proper preparation to know that. But you're right, in general, that's... Scott, you have airport background, so we'll let you speak briefly. Yeah, I've got uh, <laughs> almost 50 years of flying general aviation and over 10 years managing the airport here. Two thoughts. One is what the department is proposing seems very reasonable, well thought out, and I'm impressed with their plan of training and knowledge about the rules. So what they're asking for seems very reasonable and i believe this was something at the first rule when the first rules were made that was that was said well let's just make that up public service will have like an automatic okay and that's exactly what they're asking for and they seem to be doing it in a real reasonable way as regards to flying over houses in Sun River, the airport has zero authority to tell pilots what they can and can't do. There is a requested pattern for noise abatement, but you don't have, it's not a rule, not a law. In fact, the only laws are for instrument approach, and that instrument approach, by law, you have to come up. 
So the only law that tells the pilots what they can or can't do makes them purposely come along with the houses. All right. I have a the drone question. Yes, uh, in your uh, program coordinator section of the first page, yeah. Does the chief of police will appoint a program coordinator? Yes. I assume that's somebody within the staff. Yes. So, you know, we're in the the infancy of this program. That will most likely be a, a sergeant who will over be in charge of the two operators. I have a question, Lieutenant. Yes, um, for the monthly reports, <clears throat> we anticipate that any um, um, your own usage would be just somewhere in all of the reports or would it be a separate report with the reason why? So it, it depends. So uh, we, as far as our statistics, um, we probably would uh, parse out um, so we could track drone operations. Um, and selfishly, that's also for us to track uh, mutual aid requests as well. So that would be parsed out. Uh, additionally, as far as any use of the drone, um, it is documented either in an incident report or in a criminal report uh, per our policy. So it would be documented in two separate spots. As far as yearly uh, stats, I'm sure that's pretty easy to do. Um, and then as far as what you see in the scene, uh, you might um, see that. So people, that can answer people's questions as well. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Would, 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 yes, would sir. it be possible for uh, the present management to make the same kind of statement as a past management had about the work that you're doing and the proposal here? For, yeah. Certainly. Um, yeah. It, yeah, having the, the approval to the statement to that effect by okay. the present management of the airport could be helpful. Okay. We, we, that should not be an issue. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yes, and then how many drones are you guys looking to purchase? Uh, presently two. Okay. Now that might expand, given depending on budget to three, just because. Uh, so we have an auxiliary, but we didn't see the need for more than two at this time. Okay. That gives us coverage for most of the week. It, it, they'd have to get it approved by the SSD treasurer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll apply for a grant again next year. <laughs> All right. Any other questions for Lieutenant Lopez? Just one that's sort of related, but not totally wrong, okay. is um, the um, license plate readers. Where is that program? We're saying it. So actually, we were researching more of that this morning. So uh, as far as Fourth Amendment rights and policy and where they could fit here, we have researched uh, several different options and uh, looked into uh, a couple different companies and their different capabilities. Sorry to go off topic, but... Um, uh, and um, legality uh, issues as well. Um, what it looks like is if we choose to go that route, uh, placing them in a general place to uh, that is open to the public that monitor that specifically just sees say in ingress and egress from Sun River uh, is not violating rights and should be okay. Um, and uh, choosing a provider uh, that uh, the specific uh, pictures uh, that are taken or data that is, uh, is taken is no more intrusive than like a red light camera, um, if actually a little bit less. So we've looked into it. Uh, it's as far as cost. One is considerably better, um, which is what I prefer, but we're still looking into their capabilities and uh, solar capabilities and other things. Or do we need to work? Does it need to have a drop from public works? We'd like to avoid that, things like that. So um, that is still being research is still on our um probably going to make it into our strategic plan here so uh, on that note um you know my thought is it, if that's something you come back with a proposal mm -hmm. for you know fixed cameras looking at at streets it's okay. it's on it would be on SROA property yep. um so I would ask that you come up with kind okay. of a similar policy okay. um for use what the footage would be used for come back to SROA to the board and I would want, uh, I would suggest that that be a specific policy that's adopted by our board. Um, so our owners know what it's going to be. And, and given our, our where we are currently to expand, uh, looking into legality, looking into best practices and uh, other regional programs 
and state programs, um, we have not put together the policy that we've been prepared to show you just yet. So I had experience with those in uh, actually virtually every state the union allows us for um, we used them for uh, enforcement of vehicle emissions testing. Yeah, I mean, they, they are here. Ben PD has them in every car. Yeah. Um, All right. My understanding is that the cheaper system is a better system, can use solar, can use um, cell phone type transmission, doesn't require a physical, uh, has to do a, a drop on uh, on telephone transmissions or power. Is that right? That's what it looks and that looks to be correct. Yeah. yeah I don't think we I mean we'll have a time an right. opportunity right. to talk about this yeah. again in the future. So we don't need to run this yeah. one to the ground right now. Okay. All right. Any other questions on the UAS policy chain? Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank Thanks, Steve. Thank and just for clarity on that, I will forward this to the Covenant Committee for meeting in February. Okay. Good. All right. Assistant General Manager Caceres. Yes. yes. President Bainey, thank you very much. If you all, as board members, will turn to the back of section three of your board books, it's about four pages from the rear. Um, you will find the um, pages and documents we'll go over today for our mission model update. And this will actually be for the end of the enrollment season for 2022. Um, so I'll give you a second everyone to get there. So the first page you see is two different charts. Um, one it shows you this is what I've been um, each of you have seen here um, as we go through this process. Um, you'll see that member preference renew is the most um, sales in regard to the category itself followed by member preference new, an extended family renew, and extended family new. Um, those categories typically the last few years have been the ones that have received uh, the most enrollments. Um, switching down to the number of total passes issued for the year, um, we're sitting- for, for, yeah. for, um, The three categories on the left, seven-day extended family, long-term renter, and external commercial. I mean, again, because of scale, right. are there actually ones there? Yes, there are. Okay. Um, giving an idea, um, seven day extended family upgrade. We had about 12 of those people that took out the seven day and they extended up to the annual okay. um, extended family. And then long term renter, we had 42, I think, this year long term renters. And extended commercial, we had um, five or six. And so those are considered like um, in addition to um, what's in the works at the village or the North Store on this part of a commercial property owner in Sun River. They would have access to our membership program. Yeah, via that. And, and I only ask because I mean, it you know, we should always be looking at this and says, does it make sense to continue with these right. programs? It's something that yeah, it's a great question to ask. And um, yeah, it's a long term renter. It varies depending on the economy. Yeah. Um, and when I say that is when there are, let's say, the economy has shifted to where there is less short term rentals. And the long term renter jumps up usually, is what happens. Um, owners that don't live in their home full time, they will lease their home out um, for longer periods of time in those type of economy years. Um, so that does fluctuate over time. Um, and we, the seven day, it's a very easy upgrade for people. What happens is they can use seven days non consecutive throughout the year. And if they choose to, if they feel like they've gotten, they were coming back at some point during the year and want to have access, but at that point, they don't have the ability to purchase another seven day card. We give them that option to extend up to the price of the annual card. Mm -hmm. um, so it's still it's not hard on our staff to facilitate that either. It's okay. a quick transaction. Right. And then extended commercial, that's always been a um, an opportunity and a partnership that we've developed in Sun River with other businesses. So whether it's the resort, the village, um, property owners like where the actual store itself on the north end or south end, um, those individual prop employees of those businesses would have access. And it's more of a a goodwill partnership that we've created. Okay. If we can help them recruit, it benefits us all. Right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And it's, once again, it's, it's, it's part of our past program. So it's nothing that we have to do differently to administer that. Okay. So it works pretty smoothly. Right. Another good question. Sure. Um, overall, the number of passes issued. So we didn't quite get to President Beanan's 10,000 mark that he was hoping for. <laughs> uh, but we finished at 7,329, uh, which was 
39 less than last year, mm -hmm. um, but you can see it's um, slightly more than 300 where we were in 2018 and also almost in 2019. So what that shows you is we are back to the levels um, versus pre-COVID levels in regards to number of passes issued, which is really important to see. Um, you know, and it's, if you go back, I was doing some research all the way back to 2016, we've averaged somewhere between 6,500 to where we are now at 7,300 over the last, that last eight year period, um, nine year period, I guess now. So it's important to see that, that it's, um, the consistency is there. So people still see the value in the program and they continue every year to purchase passes to have access to our facilities. Yeah, I think the one thing that, you know, comes across my mind as you look at these data now is that we got about a 300 unit bump with the North Pool. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, yeah. you know, I mean, which is good. I mean, it's good, but I would have expected more. But but anyway. Part of it, I think, is is linked back to just the the relatively stable demographics that we have 15 to 20 percent, you know, permanent residents yeah. and another 40 percent peer rental and 40 percent second homes. And I think, you know, until those numbers begin to shift um, where you get um, you know, more permanent residents, that this number might stay relatively flat. Yeah. As those stay flat, this will, will stay yeah. flat. What's interesting to add to that too is that um, even though the numbers may have only jumped by 300, what you're seeing is the activity, like for example, in North Pole, once we built a new facility compared to the old facility, our numbers went from an annual average yeah. for the season of you know six to seven thousand up to ten eleven thousand. Right, right. So yeah. much more use. Of yeah, those yeah. I, I realize it's being used more, but we didn't right. We didn't attract more people into the MPP program, or we just only attracted 300. 300. 300. But what we did was, what was interesting is the extended family program, which used to be in the 400s annually, has now jumped to 700, 750. So that has almost doubled compared mm -hmm. to where it was. And a lot of that has to do with access to the to the North Pole. Okay, oh, that's yeah. a good point. Thank so you. So that adds to it. <laughs> sure. Um, switching to the second page, you'll see the um, year end, basically for the year to date, uh, monthly income total percentage wise. So member preference renew um, brought in just over 350,000 for the year. The next biggest category was extended family renew at 65,540, followed that by member preference renew at 41,000, and then extended family renew at 28,000. And then it dra dramatically dropped off from there. But the reason extended family renew is actually less passes issued than member preference new, but is the dollar amount is it was double the price. And that's the reason why there's more revenue shown there as a reference. Um, switching, just looking over our total income, you can see that we're finished at $490,905 for 2022, which is up 36,000 over last year. Part of that reason also was a $5 increase in price in the card. And that's the reason why you're seeing a higher revenue total there compared to 2021. So, so we have a kind of another big experiment going because we increased it by $15. Correct, correct, we did. And see if that actually results in more revenue or, or right. a decrease in the number of cards. So on that note, uh, we only have reported right now 15 days of, or actually 16 days of the 2023 enrollment season. Mm -hmm. And we are right almost identical to where we were in 2021 with the $15 reduced price uh, compared to where it is today for the mm -hmm. member cards card. So, so far in the first 15 days, which is about 400 and some cards, We've not seen any any attrition rate. Yeah, but most, it's, it's really are probably so, the permanent residents who are big users of Sharp. And could be, yes, yeah. right. So it's way too early to have any assumptions going forward right, so yeah. far. And also in reference to Recreation Plus, we are also um, on par where we were last yeah, year. Yeah, and that, so. that probably, that is clearly the more important number. Sure. Well, it's a bar larger number overall, yeah, yes. Yeah. And that was a 9% increase. Right. So the fact that we're still getting the same amount of properties re-upping re for the year is important. Any questions on these two sheets besides what we've gone over? Okay, so switching gear, well, staying with membership membership preference card for a moment. Um, you can see that overall, just specifically membership preference, this is not extended family, extended commercial long-term renter. We finished at 6,544 versus 6,594 with 50 cards less compared to last year. Very similar um, compared to last year and also previous years. If you look down through that listing, as I mentioned, all the way back to 2016, you can see it's hovered right around the 64, 6,500 range. Um, so it hasn't gone up a lot, but it also hasn't dropped either. Um, 
Switching to Recreation Plus, as you all, we, had, we did not have any Recreation Plus sales for the first 13 days of December <laughs> this year because um, people obviously, if they waited the 14th day, they could sign up for the new program for the following year and their um, access was good through January 31st of this year. So um, we are sitting at 924 um, compared to 842 last year. So up another 82 homes compared to the program last year. A big bump in that, as I mentioned um, a couple months ago, was one of our property management companies. It's a larger property management company in Sun River. They used to have seven homes on the program, and this year they had 35 homes on the program. So it was a huge increase. And part of that had to do with the, um, the owners of those homes wanting to get easier access for their guests to our amenities. Um, and I think that was an important push. And also, I think administratively, it was a challenge for them to process um, refunds. So basically, what they would do is a guest staying with them, if they paid a gate admission to Shark, at the end of their stay, they would reimburse them 50% of the cost it cost them to enter Shark. It's just a lot of accounting and calculation that have to be done. So I think they realized that there's an easier way to do this. And that's one yeah, reason why I, they- I think it's time for another lunch with Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. They have a lot of home. On the yeah, yeah. On River. Uh, came a little bit. This yeah, year, yeah. So. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, and I'm sure you're doing this, but I mean, you know, what we should be doing is sitting down with them every year and says, here's the data. You know, this is what's happening with your owners. And they'll probably have, and I don't know, they know to invite me now. Um, when they get together as their local management group, I go, Susan's done. So, as, we'll, as a we'll business owner, them. he's making all those evaluations. Oh, well, I, I, I know, I know, I know, but you know, I mean, you know. <clears throat> My my intent is to make sure that he understands that we're willing to partner with him. He's gonna have the same rights as everybody else has. Yeah. Nobody any special so no, partnering. Don't you ever, don't you ever watch the Allstate commercials? You know, the, <laughs> I guess the Rogers rate? <laughs> no, Rogers. You never saw that? I don't have TV. Oh, well, I can't help that. <laughs> Aaron Rodgers is talking to the Allstate agent. And he says, "What? Well, give me the Rodgers rate. There isn't a Rodgers rate. Same rate. They're getting the best. They're getting the same rate as everybody else. It's going to be great deal. Yeah, it's a great deal. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, and looking at Recreation Plus by bedroom, um, one thing I added two months ago was I added the price for the bedroom card. That was for 2022. You'll see that there. Um, and once again, the two bedroom to five bedroom is the majority of the homes that are on the program. Um, there are some larger homes like six bedrooms and seven and eight, but those are few and far between. Um, however, it is interesting to see the new homes that are being built that are coming through our community development and design committee. Those homes, you're not seeing 1,200, 1,400 square, square foot homes being submitted. They're four to six thousand square feet. Yeah, seven homes. bedrooms. So, and multiple yeah. bedrooms. Yes, yeah. correct. So just just to note that, yeah, I think the part of that has to do with just the cost of the dirt alone. Yeah, it's so much that right. it would outweigh the cost of the small. I didn't realize. I mean, eight bedroom home. That's a that's a big home. Oh, it's it's large. Yeah, that's, that's a big. Big. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's a home on my land that has like seven masters on it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's quite large. Yes. yes. Um, and once again, this has been consistent too in reference yeah. to the split between individual property owners renting their home. And those going through a property management company or condo association year is about two thirds, one third split there. And that's been pretty consistent over the last, I would say, four to five years as well. Um, switching gears to event space rental, we added Let this. Let me ask yes, a question sure. real quick. On the RPP participants, are they required to uh, register? I mean, do we have their phone number, email address, and things like that. We do, yeah, we do all that, yes. yes. Okay, correct. all right, I was gonna say that those people should absolutely be required to provide that information. But it's part of the application process. The, they have uh, to fill that out. Yeah. Agreement. Yes, uh, all right. yeah. Good. and if it's not signed, we don't, we don't. And that does go into the same database that the incident, I mean, property is. The, the nuisance property database that the police use. I don't know off the top of my head, but I will. Yeah, I think sure. uh, that should be in our. If not, we should add a clause in the bottom of the application yeah, saying, "We will." I hereby grant permission to be entered in. Yeah, I mean, it absolutely should be in that database. Right. Yeah, so basically, we use ActiveNet as our database to um, sell those broker those programs, right. and then that can be utilized across across tabulated. 
Um, looking at event space rental, just really quickly here. Um, overall, year to date sales of 92,700. Um, that includes the event space rental, um, AV charges, linens, bar sales, et cetera. Um, over budget, we're 27,000 to the good, um, which is significant. Um, they've been one of the most profitable years, I would say, the event space um, we've had in quite some time. Um, so that's important to see. And right now, we are in the process of finishing up interviews for the event manager position, and then we're really close to offering a position. So we're we're getting back into um, hopefully having 2023 be successful year for events as well. So we have some good candidates. We do. Yes. Yeah. So so this is the manager in the, the assistant. Is that position filled now or not? No, we have an event coordinator um, that would work under the event manager. Right. And so we're advertising that. But we wanted to bring the event manager on first so right. that they can be involved in who they're going to manage. I thought we hired a young man. Uh, uh, a gentleman. He can expand more on this, but um, he, he did not want to work full time. So right. it, essentially, he's more or less acting as an event assistant. He had a lot of experience. It was really good, but didn't didn't want to work full time right now. So, yes. so he'd be a us. potential third employee. Yes. Just mm -hmm. as needed. Right, but we it, have a line item for event assistant. For event assistant, yes. That's where initially he applied for event coordinator. And then as we interview with him and others yeah. that were interested in the position, he um, let us know that his time would be limited, that he'd be more than glad to help if he would set a schedule in advance. At that time, we had lost our other two event assistants, so we needed someone to come in. We had some events over the holidays. And so he's been great. He's been willing to work uh, when we need him to. just would give a schedule in advance. Good question, though. Um, overall, just real quickly, attendance numbers. We're switching from enrollment to attendance. Um, for Shark for the month of December, um, we just have 8,190 individuals come through the facility versus 8,000 last year. Um, so slight increase. Um, we had over 3,200 3, owners utilize the facility, which was up significant over last year as well, up 761. Um, and then member guests, we had a little few less member guests paying um, the guest rate to come into the facility itself for the month. Um, extended family annual that was up by over 100 uh, compared to where we were this time last year. Recreation plus, we had about 3,200 this year versus 3,400 last year, so a slight decrease there. Um, and then gate admission. So, we last November was in 2021, we brought back gate in 2021, and so we were able to have some gate admission in December 2021, but we had a further, a larger increase this year. Um, just once again, we because we've been open all year with gate, people have realized the facilities open that don't have access otherwise. So that's helpful there as well, too. And then Central Oregon Sundays, we had a very small number that took advantage of that, but that is there also. Hopefully, we'll see that number go up again in the summertime um, as we get closer to the outdoor pool opening. Uh, overall, though, it's important to see is we had over 200,000 people uh, utilizing the shark facility this summer and uh, actually all year long um, compared to 107,000 in 2021. Not a direct like like comparison because there were some limitations on in 2021 when we were open. And so there um, the numbers are higher, obviously, about 93,000. But if you compare that to 2019 and before, in 2019, 2018, 2017, we're averaging somewhere around 245 to 260,000. And we were at 200,000 this year. But speaking with Leanne and her team, um, we have found that the 200,000 number is a better customer experience for those that are there. Then you add another 60,000 people over the year, you spread that out on a daily basis. It's still, it feels tighter. And um, also I think people are enjoying the fact that it's a little less crowded. Um, so it's still, we're still able to accommodate all the members that want to come in and all the recreation plus guests that want to come in, but not, and we've also realized that we had to make some adjustments based on our occupancy levels too. And so that's one reason why that number is down. Is that through 1130 or 1231? That's to be 1231. I'm sorry. That's the typo there. Yes. That is 1231. That is 1231. Correct. Yes. And some of that might be going to the North Pool also. Correct. And some of it could be. Yes. Correct. And some of the members or in the family are going to use the North Pool as well. So, but I think, I think that's the key is that, you know, we're not, um, it, it's not as if folks are getting turned away. Um, there's just not the same number coming to Shark as right. a reduced number coming. Right. Correct. We had very few that we actually had to turn away this year. Um, there are people that would, if that came, they would just wait to someone left. So we were very good about 
if five people come out, we allow five people to come in. So it was, a, it was a, you know, but basically it was, we wanted to make sure that we got as many people through the doors that we wanted to have the experience of the facility. And that's what happened. Um, and then guest passes issued through 1231 of this year, just over 56,000, almost 5,500. Um, the number of passes that actually were redeemed at Sharks were 11,800. Um, and we had 4,600 guest passes redeemed at the member pool. So it shows you that a lot of guests took advantage of having access to the member pool. Um, we're not quite through the, the year totals with guest passes because they're actually valid through January 31st of this month, right? So next month, I'll have an update for you. Um, but prior to COVID, we were averaging about a 38 to 40% return rate um, of those guest passes redeemed. Um, and in 2021, we were at 24%. And so we'll see where we end up this year, but it's, it's low as of now, but um, we will, it's, I think it's interesting to see, you know, it's 20 guest passes per property. And even though there's, let's say there's four member preference cards per property, they just get 20 guest passes. So what you're seeing right now is that not everyone's taking advantage of the 20, even though we do get requests and people want more than 20, <laughs> but it's a very small number. They were less than 30%. Yes, correct, yes. right. Yes, well, I'll, I'll have your in totals for you guys next month. Um, and just overall member pool attendance, we don't, you know, there wasn't any recently, but overall for the year 20,000, um, compared to 2021, we had 16,000. So it, it is getting utilized more mm -hmm. um, compared, especially significantly more than it was when we, before we redid the facility. Mm -hmm. um, and then overall, um, looking at budget numbers. So we finished the year at um, 498,000 for member preference, extended the family long-term renters, just over 101% of budget. Um, Recreation Plus, we finished at 2.3 million, which was 110% of budget, which is fantastic. And then gate budget, we this was one we, um, Normally, our gate budget in 2019 and prior was around three quarters of a million, seven hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. We knew that we we're planning on bringing gate back, but we were thinking, okay, where it was a challenge to budget for that. Perfectly, we knew that we probably would not be back to those levels. So that's where the five hundred thousand came in, and we actually finished with five forty four, five sixty. I don't know. I forget. What did we budget for next year? Um, I think it was six hundred. Six hundred. Yes. Right, five seventy five. I think. It was, it was less than 600. Right, it was just less it was than 600. Five, yeah, I think it was 575. I think 575. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> any questions on these stats you all have? You just did a note for your report up at the top right. I think that should oh, be. Oh, December, December, yes. Yes. December, December. Right. yes. Thank you. Any other questions for Assistant General Manager at the Sarah? Hearing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very good report. Very appreciated. All right. Next on the agenda is Telecommunications Task Force Update. I guess I have to do that. <laughs> you and I. <laughs> yeah, James and I will take care of that. So um, I don't know how many. Board members were able to listen in on the Sun River U presentation earlier this week. Uh, but then Scott just stepped out. I was going to ask him for his feedback too. Um, but we did have the Sun River U presentation. We had pretty good participation. I think we had over 200. Well, there were 200 signed up, but there were about 150 participants. 150 yeah. participants. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so um, James and I were there to answer questions, and we also had two representatives from Ben or from TDS from to answer questions. And we had a lot of good questions, awful lot of good questions. And we didn't get through all of them, but we did get through quite a few of them. Uh, and I think um, I've gotten, I know, James, you've gotten some feedback. I've gotten some feedback from people who said it went very well. Yes. And, and I've gotten, I think, four questions so far some of those uh, two of them were redundant of what we answered the night before um and i guess i don't put you on the spot but we're gonna we will have a link i don't know if some review has that available yet no i asked about it. it's not ready yet yeah when they have that recording ready. ready they'll put it on their web page we will have a link on our web page to yeah. that right it was, it was excellent if you didn't get a chance to participate and um, Gerhard and James and, our, and the two TDS people. They were really good. And the structure okay, was good. fantastic. They only spoke for 15 minutes and then they opened it up to questions. Mm -hmm. Let the question dictate 
the rest of the presentation, which they have, everyone asked all the questions that you would have done if you'd had an hour long presentation, but I would believe it made people feel they got their questions asked instead of having 15, 20 minutes of questions after an hour yeah. long presentation. And Scott, I don't know if you've gotten any feedback. Um, no, I, I, well, I've got some feedback from some people that watched that. It was great. They really enjoyed it and thought it was very well presented. I got some feedback also that they said um, they appreciated the fact that everyone was just presenting facts and not necessarily presenting opinions. Mm -hmm. And that came from both the TDS people as well. They felt that they were being honest about stuff as opposed to trying to sell you on TDS. That's what I heard mm -hmm. from some people, you know. I, but I thought it was good. We had the largest number of people sign up that we've ever had for any class to this one. There was about 240 people that signed up for it, but um, about 140 actually watched it, yeah. which is kind of normal yeah, because a lot that. of those that sign up yeah. watch on the same computer. Sure. So there were more than 140, but there were 140. At one point, I, early on, I saw 150 when they looked at members signed in. Yeah, I mean, well, and at I, the end, I they're still keep exact accounts. <laughs> I checked just before they signed off, there were still 113 people that. Did the whole hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had lots of questions. A lot of questions, yeah. Lots of identical questions. Yeah. <laughs> Same yeah. over and over and over again. But it was good. I thought it was good. And then there's um in, in the scene, the February scene, it is an out yet will be coming out shortly. There's my president's message talks about the fiber to the home initiative. And so there'll be some additional information there. And then uh, we have the timeline for the, for the voting. The uh, ballot packages have been created, uh, and they will be shipped out uh, starting next week, I believe, right? Um, I just sent it to the printer. It's in their hands. Yeah. <laughs> the dates are, it goes out uh, the 23rd, 20th. and the, actually the election closes, I think we said the 22nd of February, so the 21st. 21st, yeah. yeah. So... So, and of course, there are two, two, I mean, it's the fiber to the home, but there's also the consolidated plan change on that um, discrimination. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So is there any other questions on that? Juliana, you've been quiet so far. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> All right. Uh, hearing no additional questions, uh, so now the next item is to review the board agenda for tomorrow. And it's not even, it's, it's not even, uh, not even noon yet. All right, uh, so, <laughs> so we have the standard things, the owner's forum, uh, owner's forum follow-up from previous month. Uh, Bill, I think you'll be taking care of that, right? Yeah, and then after we've heard um, tomorrow's, if there are any uh, homeowners, at the end of that section, I think if there's to be follow-up by board members or board staff, we'll make assignments or seek volunteers to do that follow-up. Yeah, all right. Uh, we'll have a recap of the uh, today's work session. Uh, and then, of course, approvals of the minutes. Uh, and financial report, we will not have a financial report tomorrow. So that would, and we have uh, General Manager Lewis's report. Uh, any committee reports? I don't think there were any that I remember other than the standard like finance. I don't even know if there's a finance committee over there. So uh, Center of a Service District report. Uh, Tony can kind of bring us up to speed as to what was covered uh, at our meeting yesterday. Uh, committee membership actions, none. Uh, committee action request, there's the nominating committee um, board application form of proposed revisions. And so um, Holly said that you know she took some notes uh, based on some comments from Clarks and other and she'll have that available for us to review tomorrow and to vote on that. that. Okay, uh, board action request second reading of resolution 2022-009, which is conformance with the HB 2534 and discriminatory language. Uh, we had one of those, we had the first reading 
back in December, I guess. Yes, or in November. In November. Yes. And so now we're going to be doing the second reading, and if it passes, the second reading. And again, just real quick, those are things that those are uh, changes for conformance with the rule that didn't need to go to a vote. Um, yeah, they're not in the consolidated plan, but in the other right. rules and documents. Yeah. Right. So, so we'll have, and then uh, potentially an executive session tomorrow, James. Uh, I don't think so. Oh. You know, I had discussed with you one item, and no. Joe and I were working on um, it, 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 it. It's potential litigation that that we could or could not take on, and we need to do some more exploration on our end. Probably bring it to you in February. It has to do with some citations um, that we've issued um, in collection of fees. Um, I don't I want to go into it now. Yeah, regular sessions. Yeah, I think one other thing we can. Um, I'll, I'll put out there. We we don't have an executive session planned today, but if the board would like to discuss a topic, um, one of the things that uh, I became aware of late in December is that I have um, the responsibility of writing a performance review for our magistrate. Uh, and the magistrate actually works for the board, doesn't work for James, but works for the board. And so reports to the board. And uh, because I became aware of it in late December uh, and I needed to get it done in early January, none of the board was able to participate in that review. So if you would like to go over the review, we can do that in the executive session. Um, but, and, you know, I mean, <clears throat> As having to do the review, one of the things I had to do is review what does the magistrate actually do, <laughs> you know, and when do we use the magistrate? And and some of this stuff was, uh, I mean, in, in the whole process of what happens with the magistrate, were things that I was not familiar with. And so um, we we can certainly cover that at some point in time too. If you were so inclined, the magistrate has hearings once a month. Um, yeah. Uh, typically midweek at 10 a.m. Um, right here, and folks that have been issued citations come and they can discuss that with the magistrate, and she, you know, weighs that and either upholds the fine, gets rid of the fine, or finds something in the middle, like you would in any other legal proceeding in front of the judge. Um, so I would invite you to to come and sit in on one of those because it's it's a big part of, um, and, and I don't mean to to hound on it, but it's a big part of what your staff does is because we're out there enforcing the rules every day. And so by the time it gets to the magistrate, you know, our compliance folks have had, we try not to get to citations and get to the magistrate. So, but but you can kind of see what our staff does every day for rule compliance and how it, it ends up in front of the magistrate. Yeah. And there's kind who of is, a, sorry, who is the magistrate? Her name is Joe Zucker. Joe She's Zucker. been the magistrate for SROA for, I can't remember how many years. She spoke with us, uh, Juliana, yeah. uh, when we were talking um, two months ago, maybe? Yeah, she gives her annual report. Yeah, I think. Oh, that's is. correct. That's right. Okay. That's Thank who you. She, she's been doing it a number of years, and she is a lawyer. She was a trained mediator and it does mediation. So she's right. very good. Mm -hmm. Can you send a schedule? Okay. Yes, we can even yeah, well, we can form on to you. Yeah. Yeah. And I did review her. her you, you, yeah, you reviewed her last time, right? Yes. And yeah. Previously. Yeah. And I hope that your review was very positive because mine certainly were. Yeah. We are fortunate to have somebody in the judicial end of things as skilled as she is in dealing with people and keeping most of us. Okay. Yeah. So maybe we can say a few words in executive session. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can, I can go over. I mean, one, one of the things that I did, I can not get into the content of the review, but one of the things I did is, um, <clears throat> I talked to um, SROA staff that's involved with the magistrate. I talked to or, or got a, a very good document from a member of the judicial council, and so a magistrate's um, opinion. If an owner takes a certain route, there are four different routes the owner can take. But if they take option four, they can actually it's, it's handle more or less like a trial. Yep. They can present evidence and stuff like that. Uh, and that, if they take that route, that opinion can be appealed to the judicial council. We have three members on the judicial council who cannot be board members. 
And so one of the members of the Judicial Council gave me their perspective. And then uh, James and um, his team provided me with a list of people who have had um, cases before the magistrate over the past 12 months. Uh, and I sent uh, an email out to about 25 of them. You know, about 10, 10 or so responded, and they gave me their perspective. And so I <laughs> integrated all that information into the review and presented it to Joe, and she thought it was uh, very fair. So then, well, I got a question. So, what if somebody circumvents that and they go to a small claims court or something? Is well, <laughs> well, I mean, no. <laughs> David's got direct experience um, with that. That's a setup, Larry. <laughs> uh, um, actually, um, we I don't know whether to go over it now. It's concluded at Small Claims Court, and it's not any litigation. I can go over it right now. We have a an owner that got a project approved through the design committee did not complete all of the requirements of the design committee um, and then requested their deposit returned, um, the construction deposit. And we don't return the deposit until we do the inspection and everything's done. That's the carrot yeah. to finish your project. Um, that individual, when that decision came out from the design committee, they did not ask for a reconsideration or appeal. So effectively, they accepted that decision with those conditions and those requirements, but then did not complete it. Um, we did not return the deposit. We kept saying, we will re return your deposit, finish the project. Uh, there was a lawsuit in small claims court. Small claims court, this hearing was just uh, last month in December. Um, and the owner made the case um, that one of the requirements of the, uh, uh, of the design committee to remove a wall really, even though there was manual language talking about if you have a feature that's required to be screened and that feature moves, that that screening feature, the wall, needs to be removed as well. Made the argument that the hot tub over here really was not screened by the wall over here. Made that argument to the small claims judge. Um, the small claims court judge found that there was no nexus that was provided by our design committee. They did not even though they cited a, you know, essentially a section of our manual that says if you move A, B has to go away, they did not make any findings, so to speak, as to you know this is is actually screened by the wall. The argument that the that the plaintiff made, our owner said, you know, it's so far away that it doesn't really screen it. So if I move this, why do I need to remove the wall? The judge found two things: found that this owner was not in compliance with our requirements of the design committee. He didn't want to wade into usurping our design review process. Yeah. He said, you know, procedurally, you know, effectively, he was saying procedurally, you didn't appeal it. You did not, um, you, you know, you're not in compliance. But he also found that you get your $2,000 back because there was no nexus. There was no finding. There was no correlation that was made through that decision making process as to why this needs to this feature needs to go away because you you move the hot tub and that it may sound confusing but as it relates back to our process there's still a citation the citations that are pending on this homeowner because the small claims process has no bearing on our on our uh, administrative process. our administrative process goes through the magistrate so um you know, effectively, you know, our Joe Zucker, our magistrate, is going to hear and has heard actually already that, um, you know, that owner is not in compliance with the decision of the design committee. And Keith, I can't remember, she upheld, you remember? Yes, the, the magistrate upheld the citation. The citation because it's still, it met, because the homeowner itself, the plaintiff, did not meet the requirement of the conditions of approval. And they're still not met yet. And so that's the reason she upheld it. So, 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 so what's the result of this? So, small claims? Yeah. So the small claims court decision awarded her the $2,000 return of the deposit. You know, yeah. that's not revenue for us anyway. It was something that was intended to right. go back to the owner. Right. Um, but it does not have a bearing on saying that 
they're in compliance with our process. Yeah, so they so, still can be a fine. So we're still going forward with the citation process and the fine yeah. that would require her to do one of two things, either to, to get rid of that feature that they require to get rid of or submit a brand new application, which she's intending to do, Correct. to ask the design committee to leave that feature on the basis of what the small claims court judge decided, which is, there was no correlation and you did not previously tell me you didn't provide the how and why this needs to go away because I knew this feature. So, so that, I'm trying to do that, 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 that then gets rolled into the new design manual. Yeah. Well, what it does, what it, what it well, does is, and I'm just being honest is working with our design committee is to work with them and work in our decision-making process that we need to be more complete as to if you're going to require something, have a condition of the approval, you need to tell how and why to a more definitive point. I see. More than just reference the section of the manual. So getting back to the point, the, um, yeah. the amount is what, $2,000 that we- That we refund. That we refund. So did we refund that or? We did, we are under so the direction the of the board. Uh, the fine was two hundred fifty dollars. Oh, okay, but but if there's non-compliance, you know, there's still the compliance with with our or or to or to seek a new approval or a different decision from the design committee. Yeah. If you don't seek that and there's continued non-compliance, we continue to cite you. There's an ongoing citation until you comply, and that's the case with 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 any citation we issue for any violation. The fine goes up. Um, it doesn't go not up. on these. It's not a graduated file. No, it's it's, not, it's just the same citation on a monthly basis. Yeah. Okay. And and those are the types of things that our magistrate hears and listens to. So do we have a way to let owners know that this magistrate process is in place? Uh, it's part of all of our part of our governing documents. Um, yeah, you know, nobody reads those. It, it's on the well, citation. It's on the it's citation. citation. It's also, so if you get a citation, it tells you on the citation okay. process that this process is that there. you gotcha. can either. It was what Gerhard was referring to. You have kind of four. You can either pay the citation. You, you pay half the citation and you're done. Correct. Okay. But you still have to comply. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you still have to you comply. Have to but but you, you pay half the half the citation and you don't have to go in front of the magistrate or anything. Right. And then there are other. Um, you, you can go in front of the magistrate and you can go in front of them where you can only, you can't present evidence, but you can talk. And then you can also go into a like, full trial mode. Okay. You know. it, it's similar. Think about the simplistic maybe comparison is if you get a speeding ticket, you can either pay it or you can go to court and you can contest that there are extenuating sure. reasons why yeah. you shouldn't have got it. That's kind of how it works. But, but I know where to go in that case. In that yeah. case, yeah. and that's on the citation, it, it will tell you before like yeah. here. Like I told you. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, we do the same thing. Okay. In addition to that, it's in the introduction of the design manual itself, yeah. explaining the process, uh, the re-review process and the appeal process, how that would be adjudicated through the magistrate process. Okay. If you'd like to find out. <laughs> oh, <no thanks. laughs> this is, uh, uh, I was just curious as to how the, uh, you know how somebody could circumvent the process. Yeah, yeah it, 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 we talked about this internally. Uh, effectively, the the small claims court suit was uh, um, a route to try to uh, circumvent our appeal process of the design committee. Yeah. Um, successful in in getting the deposit back, but it does not obligate us in any way outside of our own process. Okay. And the part of the reason, just you know, the deposit came back to her is she was doing an, an addition project on the home that had nothing to do with the hot tub itself. So that that part of the project was completed. It's just the outstanding compliance issue was not met with conditions of approval. So that's another detail of how why she got it to come and spot the back. Um, All right. Any other discussion on that? So um, if you wanted to review. Review the review I wrote. We can go into executive session. Otherwise, we can adjourn at this point in time. Oh, don't we already have an executive session it's on the agenda? It's only for that. It's, oh, it's okay. always just listed as it's always on there in case it's you always there, yeah. want to do. Yeah. Oh, but it said yes to discuss the personnel matter. That's it. 
Oh, that was it. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't feel the need. I thought if we were already going into it, you could add a few comments. But yeah. so we don't need to. No, I, not not for me. <laughs> Anybody else? Mm -hmm. So um, not me. For tomorrow, will you and James before at last month's meeting the following week? You guys are going to be meeting with the commissioners. Will you be talking about that a little bit tomorrow? The breakfast with can. commissioners. Yeah. So, oh, that, that's, that's really kind of an SSD thing. But when the cut when the SSD stuff comes up, we can okay, talk great. about that. Great. Yeah. And you didn't ask for any other business that there's any other interest. No, no, I don't. Have, I don't. Have, does anybody else have any other business? You didn't ask. Yeah, yeah I did. <laughs> but I covered it. Good, good point. <laughs> Is there any it other? Maybe someone in the office. <laughs> Hearing none. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So move, Burke. <laughs> All right, thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that one. All right, thank you, Larry. We have motion and a second. Any further discussion? Oh, no. Not even none. Hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, we are adjourned. I think there's lunch. There is lunch. That's yeah. I think we're getting there. Bye, guys. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Bye.